So I'm recording. So we're going to start photosynthesis. It is an application of transport across the membrane. All right. In fact, we're talking about co-transport and active transport, and there's all kinds of transporting going on in photosynthesis, which is why it's important that you understand what transport is. Sure. I'm, remember, I'm recording this, so you can always get it, anything you're missing once I post it. And I found out today that I can post it on the, on the CMSD mobile uh, uh, Wi-Fi, so that's wonderful. I can post it in school, so you don't have to wait till I get home. All right, so I'll say it one more time, and that is that photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis is an application of membrane transport. A lot of what we talk about in photosynthesis and respiration, how do we make ATP? That's really the question, because ATP is how everything's run. Is that right? Because yes, yeah. what's the question you, everybody has, bless you, every human has, how do I make money, right? And the cell, every cell, every living cell on, on Earth has the question, how do I make ATP? Because ATP is their money. Life needs ATP. You need money, right? No money, no food, no house, no car, no phone, no good, right? No ATP, no energy. No energy, no life, no good. Understood? That's why we call ATP the cell's currency. The energy currency of the cell, right? Currency, money. So we're going to be talking about that in earnest today. We're going to get in depth. Now, my question for you before I go on, I promised you a moment where you might ask a specific question if it's not covered on the videos that I've uploaded or, or if it's not covered in the notes so that uh, I'm going to say, let me answer it now. If it is covered, I'm going to ask you to come after school or during advisory to get tutoring. Because if it's covered and you haven't watched it, it's not my fault, right? So now let's go ahead and cover it again. Or at, let me say, are there any questions about membrane transport that you don't feel was covered well enough? Please. Yes. Okay, so in the reading in Chapter 7, um, they were talking about um, factors that affect the rate of diffusion. So will... Um, what they say, concentration, temperature, and pressure. So we only focus on the concentration. Will there? Will it be? What a perfect question! And so that was an amazing question. That was an educated, prepared question. Do y'all see how that question was? Why I love that question? She integrated everything: the reading, the class discussion. Wonderful. I wish I could say your name, but uh, we're going to focus on concentration. But you're right, temperature and pressure does impact diffusion, all right? So think about it. Think about what impacts if you are in this corner and you fart, what's going to impact that gas moving across the room? The wind, the pressure. What's wind? Air pressure, right? So if there's wind, if there's a fan, if I'm standing in front of a fan, that's bad luck for you if I fart, right? Because you're going to smell it a lot faster, right? And, of course, the, the other thing that impacts diffusion rate is temperature. And you know that because you know that some people put cologne on, right? And what happens when they're in the gym and they have cologne on, they're working out, what happens to that, that cologne? It gets strong, doesn't it? And girls that have sports and boys that have sports, you know that when your fellow, your fellow students, if you don't wear cologne or perfume, when they work out, holy cow, you don't want to be next to them when they're working out, right? Because that stuff comes off of them really quickly. That's because of that whole, the higher the temperature, the faster things evaporate, right? And once they evaporate and go into gas, that's when you smell them. Does that make sense? But now, why is it that we are concerned mostly about concentration with the cells? That's because in cells, we're not really, what we're dealing with in cells is a pretty constant temperature and a constant pressure. So, what? We, we touched on it, but we didn't focus on it because in a cell, in your body, you have a constant temperature and a constant pressure. Right? I mean, you have a 97.8, maybe. Some of you might be set at 98, but whatever it is, that, that's the same. What's the only thing that really that changes inside your body? The concentration, right? So that's really what we focus on in, in, in biology with concentration. Now, gases, breathing in gases, cold versus not, 
fish breathing in gases, then temperature becomes an issue. All right, but there's all kinds of reasons why. Great question. Anything else? So, yeah. Go ahead. I know we talk about this a lot, but I'm still not fully understanding how you know when the sun moves in our You have to be told, right? So I'm not only going to touch on it really quickly. You can come and see me during advisory after school, but let me say this. It's a good question. I want to say that first of all. It's really an essential. The reason I think it's a good question is because it's really, really foundational, right? You have to understand that in order to solve the problems. And how do you know if something passes the membrane not? If it's ionic, it doesn't. If it's ionic or big, it doesn't pass through easily. It's going to need what? How is it going to need help from a protein? Exactly. Are you listening? You asked the question, but now you're not listening. So now listen to what I'm saying. If you know it's charged and you're not told anything else, then you can assume it's not going to pass unless there's a protein. If you know it's big and you're not told anything else, then you can assume it's not going to pass unless there's a protein. Or phagocytosis is happening or endocytosis, right? Where you get the, 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 the membrane swallowing up the large uh, particle. Does that make sense? So that's number one. And let me, let me answer this way. You will usually be told in an osmosis or diffusion problem that it passes or it doesn't pass. Sometimes they're going to expect that you know. For instance, most gases pass easily through the membranes. They pass through the membranes because they're small and they're nonpolar. Right? So what passes through the membranes easily? Small and nonpolar things. Bless you. The other stuff, it depends, and usually they tell you in the problem. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. Again, if you need more help, I'm here during advisory or after school today, so come and ask me. Also, I uploaded two videos today. They might help you. You might want to try to look at those, or any of the ones I posted in the, in the past, or, or you know, Khan Academy does a great job as well. There's all kinds of videos out there. The Amoeba Sisters do some good stuff with that. I like the Amoeba Sisters. Some people think they're irritating. Can we close the door, please? All right, next question. Yeah. Fluid mosaic. Yeah, we did talk about it a little bit. We remember I showed you a picture of like stained glass, and I said, "Look, this is a mosaic, and a mosaic is just a bunch of different things coming together and making a picture." Yeah. Yeah, collage. Just like a big collage. Well, that's the cell membrane. The cell membrane is not just all phospholipids. It's phospholipids and all kinds of proteins and carbohydrates and, and you know, phospholipids and just all kinds of crazy things all coming together to form one thing called the mo a membrane. And the reason we call it a fluid mosaic is because the membrane is always moving. This, the, the proteins are always constantly shifting. It's like a sea of lipids, and these, these proteins are floating in the sea, and they act like rafts. And there's, some of them are pinned down because of the exoskeleton, the, uh, the extracellular skeleton and the, and the uh, cytoskeleton. They kind of pin some things down, but mostly they move around, and uh, there isn't really much issue about it. That's why we call it a fluid mosaic model. So you have to think of the membrane as kind of this ever-changing kind of landscape, if you will. Any other questions quickly? No? Seeing none, like we're moving on. Let's take a look at photosynthesis. Well, I hope you guys have chance to look at the uh, the chapter reading. This is not from your book, but this is from a college textbook, but I, I like a lot of their diagrams, and I think some of them are very similar to the ones you have in your textbook. So uh, because of that, and because of some of the details they go into that kind of explain some of the background, I thought it was important to go ahead and do this and use this source. So this is a leaf, and obviously this, this is a photosynthetic organism that's multicellular. It's eukaryotic, right? It's called the plant, right? And plants have leaves. And leaves are tissues. Just like your skin is a tissue, leaves are tissues too. Leaves have different kinds of cells. So what's a tissue? Different kinds of cells working together, right, to do a function. Well, a leaf has tissues, and one of the tissues is the epidermis. What do you think is a good, a necessary function of this epidermis? Oh, say that again? This is the epidermis, the outside of the leaf. What do you think is a, ne it's ne what is a necessary function? Protect it. Protect it from the environment. Excellent. So a tree sitting there with leaves out, what do you think it needs to do? What kind of things need to, it, does it need protection from? The water, I mean, um, water. 
Water. Absolutely. Water's a big one. And because of that, there's this thing called the cuticle. So most leaves have this layer of, of wax. It's a fat. Wax is a fat, by the way. And what, does, what do we know about fats? What do we know about lipids? What do they do? Do they like water or do they hate water? They hate water. They hate water. So wax is, when you, when you have wax on something, what does it do to water? It repels it. Excellent. Yeah, that's right. It repels it. That's why people wax their, their, their uh, surfboards and their cars. They wax everything because when the water hits it, what does the water do? It falls off, right? It beats off. Why does it beat off? Because wax repels water. If there's no wax in the water, then you have osmosis is going to happen into the cell or out of the cell. You don't want that to happen. It's going to mess up the leaf because the cells mess up, and you don't want that, right? So you want you don't want the wa the cells losing water or gaining water because of evaporation or because there's too much water. So the cuticle acts like a shield, like a raincoat. All right. So you know your raincoat acts the same way. Your raincoat is repels water. You ever see people with ponchos and raincoats in the rain or umbrellas? They repel water. That's exactly what the cuticle's doing. Question? So could it like take too much water? Well, the, remember, where does a plant get the water? From our lab, what did we learn? What oh, from, we, the from, the from the ground. So the plant's getting its water, it's drinking from the ground. So it's not really drinking from its leaves. In fact, the only thing that it needs to do with the leaves is to transpire. And what transpire, what's transpiration is, is like they're a plant form of sweating. Like perspiration, right? But it's transpiration because... It's just the, the water evaporates and leaves out of the stoma. Now, be very, very careful with this word. This word stoma is this opening, and tomorrow I'll show you some pictures of it. It's really creepy. When you look, next time you eat salad, you're going to be like, <gasps> there has these thousands, of, they look like lips and mouths. Underneath, there's thousands of these little mouths underneath each leaf. They let gases in and out. Because you have this cuticle on both sides, the leaf is pretty, is pretty sealed. But you need to have a way to get things in and out, right? You need to let gases out. You need to let... What gases are coming out of the leaf? Carbon dioxide. No. Oxygen. Oh, oxygen. That's right. Oxygen is coming out. So that's good. It's good. That's why we do this. And what, and what, has come, what gases are coming in? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So we have to have that gas exchange, and that's why they have stoma. Otherwise, they wouldn't need stoma. Ah, it's stoma. See, that's it. You have to be careful. And the chloroplast is a very similar word. And we'll look at that. So it's stoma, S-T-O-M-A. Once you put an R in there, it changes the word completely. It's crazy. I hate it when words are very close together because we get confused, right? Especially if it's in the same uh, context. So stoma in plants is the opening in the leaf that lets gases exchange. But the problem is that what can be, what, as oxygen is coming out and carbon dioxide is coming in, what else can get in and out? Bacteria. Well, yeah, that's true, but mm, not really. The waste goes down in the roots. But uh, bacteria is possible, yes, but the key is that in the plant, what gets in and out of the stoma is water. Water leaves, and uh, water leaves, it evaporates and goes out. That's a good thing for plants. And we'll talk about why that is, because then what happens is, is up at the top, as the water leaves the leaves, that creates a negative pressure, and what does that do to the water in the roots? As water's leaving here, it leaves an empty space, so what does that do to the roots? What, what does that encourage? The water goes up, up the tree or the plant because water's leaving the top, and what you get is this high water concentration at the roots and low concentration up at the top and what happens to high to, things move from high to low so you get water going up the up the plant through the xylem through the through the uh, let's call them uh, uh, through the tubes the vascular tissue right the tubes the water comes up from the roots and into and out through the leaves you have this circulation of of water that's good as long as there's plenty of water what's when is it not good <coughs> When it's, not, when it's not enough or there's maybe there's too much. And so we have to do things differently in the rainforest and in, differently in, where, in places are where, they're, where their places are very hot, really. It's not really about the rain. Or in the desert, right? Because you if you open the stoma out in the desert, and the, what's going to happen to all the water in the plant? 
it's going to evaporate, and then there's is there water in the, a lot of water in the ground? Not really, so the plant's going to die because it's not going to run out of water. So plants, these these plants have to do things a little differently. We'll talk about that by the end of the week. Yeah. So let me draw it. Let me draw it. That's a good qu- That's a good point. Let's go ahead and draw it. I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's important. Uh, it'll be a long-term importance. But think about this. Here are the tree's leaves, right? And I know it's horribly drawn, but whatever. So there's the branches and kind of, you know, there's... Mendoza, you messed it up when you started putting the lines. Well, the lines are branches. The trees are much more, and I'm not going to draw a giant tree, but the, the, the point is I'm not going to draw a thousand leaves. The, shh, thank you very much. So, co- all right, let's all be quiet, please. All right, so we have all these leaves, all right? And you're not, you're not listening. And so you have, of course, you have a ground. Let's make the ground this, like so. And underneath the ground, what happens to these, to these, uh, to the tree? What, what does it split up into? Roots, right? And down, that's right. And down here, you have the water table. And so there's water down here. And we'll look, and there's, but now the water's here. The, there's a lot of water, so this is high, right? High concentration of water. And up here, water's leaving. As water evaporates out of the stoma, what, what, so you got high, what's going to happen here? It's going to go up. And why is it going up? It's, it's hydrogen bonding is one force, and of course it's the, and it goes into the leaves, right? And then where does it go from there? And it goes out again oh, as a gas. And that's constantly flowing. As a gas. Yeah, it evaporates up here. It turns into gas, steam. We call it steam, right? Yeah. That's what happens to you. When you're running, you guys go exercise, or you go, go, you go work out, lift weights, you're sweating. What happens to that water? Why, is, why are you not wet the rest of the day? Because that water does what? Evaporate. Evaporates. And if you've worked out a lot, you know that, the, that and you have to work out a lot, you, when you feel, what do you feel on your, on your forehead when, the, you felt when, you, when that water is evaporated, what's left on your skin? Have you ever felt that? Dirt. It's like a, it's it, like dirt. It's, it's not kind of dirt. Like a, like it's a it's, waxy it's, it's it's it is it, it like crystal. It feels like sand, right? Yeah. Well, it's salt. Ugh. It's salt. It's salt because what your 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 sweat is salty, right? And so the water evaporates, but salt stays behind. And it dries, and that's the dry up. The water leaves. It turns into gas. Because you like, like over sweat, like all yeah. your sweat. Just yeah, like it could, you could dehydrate. That it would be. It's difficult to do unless you're working out a lot. But yeah, or, or you're not. If you're just not hydrated. Then you become dehydrated. It could be really, really dangerous. So be careful. Yeah. Yeah. So do a cactus got a stomach? What? That's a brilliant question. Hold on to that question because at the end of the week, it's a brilliant question. At the end of the week, there's a way plants have, if evolution has found a solution to the problem. And we're going to look at it. So just keep thinking about it. But it's a great question. I'm going to move on though and focus on, on what I want to talk about today. But it's a great, please write it down. <coughs> write it down because that's the kind of question I'm looking for when I grade your notebooks. Please. That shows you thinking. And if those of you that didn't come up with that question, maybe you should write that question down. I yeah, <laughs> I, I'm glad. I believe it. It's a it's a great it's a great. Uh... All right, so take a look at one of these cells. If we take a look at one of these cells, we're all familiar with this cell, right? It's a eukaryotic cell. It has cell walls, so we know it's a plant cell because it has all the characteristics of a plant cell. It has chloroplasts here, right? And it has, there's mitochondria as well, but we don't, they're not drawn. There's a Golgi body. There's endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. This is the, de- the nucleus. There's the central vacuole, right? So we all know that this is a plant cell, right? Everybody should be able to, to, to yeah. visualize that, yeah? Yes. No, it's eukaryotic. Why, how do we know? Many ways. Number one, all plants are eukaryotic. And what does this have? A, a cell wall. If you don't know that, there's more work. You're, put on your, put that in your list. Write that down. Write it down. If you get confused, write it down. Stop speaking to me about it. Write it down. 
That's something you got to come to tutoring about. I don't have time to go back and cover that. We're going to go ahead. If it's, oh Lord, you don't listen, you don't think. Moving on. So here's a chloroplast. This is a general format of a chloroplast, and its job is to take light and water and CO2 and make sugar. That's what it does. That's it. It makes sugar for every for the plant. It's making sugar for itself. But of course, we steal the sugar, right? Animals, one thing at a time, write it down. If you have a question, write it down. I don't want to interrupt the flow right now. I will allow you to ask questions later if we have a chance. So we have these little structures you're going to have to know. Now look at this word. There's the word. It's really annoying. People that have done... That at least one person did their homework and they asked, "What not that stroma? Well, no, stroma is actually, stoma is what? That's that little it's the, gas. It's the lips. opening in the leaf. The stroma, that's right, it's the lips. That's a big, that's a, the, stro, the stoma, S-T-O-M-A, S-T-O-M-A is, a bi, is an opening in the leaf. It's a bigger scale. The stroma is inside an organelle, inside a cell in an organelle. And a stroma is, one, is, the mem, is this space right here. See the space? It's called the stroma. So all of that is stroma. That's the space. All this space you see here. So it's, it's a fluid-filled it? cavity. That's right. It's a space. Fluid what? It's just a space. A, flu, a, a space with fluid inside the chloroplast. Right, which is the organelle. So is this just this side? Yes. The stroma. It's just a space. It has a concentration of, of ions that's gonna allow us to make ATP. It's gonna allow us it's a, it's it's just like the like if you wanna think of this similar to the blood of the chloroplast, right? It's the fluid that has the stuff that the chloroplast needs to, to do its thing. All right. The concentration is the amount of stuff in there. Not space, that stuff that's in that space. So then when we're talking about the stroma, it's this space. The, the thalicoid is this membrane. Ah, membrane. Thalic. Fluid, concentration, membranes. What might we be talking about? This is all in Chapter 8, by the way. We might be talking about transporting stuff, right? Across that membrane. Concentration inside the stroma. See, these are all ideas that should be floating around your heads. Now, a stack of these thalicoids, a stack of them, see like pancakes, you see them? Yeah. The, the stack of them is called a, gr a granum. These are vocabulary words you should become familiarized with. You should know what these are. When you think of a chloroplast, you should be thinking about this. And we covered it a little bit already in your cell project earlier in the year. So, okay. so a granum is a stack of these thalicoids, just a stack. And the, there's an inner membrane here, and then there's an outer membrane. What is the thalicoid? The thalicoid is the membrane. You said it's a stack of what? Thalicoids. Thalicoids. Thalicoid. Look at, please, here's the two things I need you to do. I need you to do your reading. That's number one. And number two, pay attention here. I said your thalicoid is your membrane. You see it all connected here. A stack of them, you see the stack of these membranes is called the granum. What is that? Does the chloroplast make chlorophyll? Chloroplast does make chlorophyll, yes. But it makes chlorophyll so it can do what? What is the, chlor what is the chloroplast trying to do? I said it's it already. Sugar. Sugar. It it's sorry. trying to make sugar. Look, I don't know what else I can do except say it. When you hear this, when I upload this and you listen to it, please listen to the fact that I already told you and I'm still getting the same questions. So I'm telling you, a chloroplast, clearly its job is to take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and make sugar. We went through a lab, a virtual lab in class, where you did that, right? Those were the questions you answered. You put them, you turned them in. You got credit for it. What are the three products of photosynthesis? Or what are the products of photosynthesis? Sugar and oxygen. What are the, what's necessary to do photosynthesis? 
carbon dioxide and water and light. Right? So those are that you you know this or you weren't paying attention. Yes. Okay. I know you said the Bronx Double Uh-huh. What are the stacks? Like what are they? They're just stacks of membranes. The membranes are here. And if you stack them, do you see it? One, two, three. This is a membrane. Do you see the membrane? Do you see it? Yes or no? I see it. Okay, so you see that there's a stack of them? Yeah. That's it. They look like um, it's a piece of it's, it's They're just all stacked together. They're folded and stacked. All right, so this isn't going to be important because the whole point of these membranes is to capture sunlight and to act as a barrier, have a high and a low. If you have high and low, you have the ability to make ATP. Yeah. So without the thiol, whatever that is, they not, uh, it's not chloroplast? That's right. Without these structures, they're not chloroplasts. Now, you can have photosynthesis without these structures, there's, but it's not as efficient. The chloroplast is incredibly efficient in making sugar from sunlight, water, and uh, CO2. All right. So this is important that you know the, the anatomy of a chloroplast because there's some things that happen out here in the stoma, in the stroma, and there's some things that happen in the granum or in the thylakoid. So there's gonna, you have to be clear on where this stuff is happening because once we get to the next test, which is right before Thanksgiving break, I'm going to ask questions, what's happening, where does this happen, where does that happen, okay? So you have to know where, every, where the stroma is, where the, uh, where the thylakoid is, What's the inner space, the inner membrane space, the outer membrane space? These are important. There's more anatomy to the chloroplast, but that's the important part, all right? Because I promised you I would identify the important parts, right? I just did. Let me highlight them for you in case you weren't listening. So granum, know what the granum is. Know what the stroma is. Know what the thylakoid is. For sure, those three are 100% necessary. Now, you might, in fact, I would even, I would even say, let's just kind of make them more, let's make them pink instead, kind of a red, important, and let's make yellow, caution, no inner membrane and outer membrane. So if you know those vocabulary words, you're gonna have a better idea of where this stuff is happening. So what would I do? I would draw this out, or if you want, print it and white out the, the actual names and label them on my index card, right? I would do A, B, C, D, and E, and I would cover up the, the words somehow, either scratch them out or white them out, whatever you want, on my index card. I don't care if you print it and glue it on or you draw it out, whatever you want. And just make sure you know your spaces. Flip them and flip them over and over again. If I see this index card, you know, you guys keep asking me what index cards you're looking for, when you grade the notebook, this is one of them, right? I'm just telling you right now. Yeah. Uh, what is the purpose of the inner membrane? We'll talk about those. We'll talk about the purposes in a minute. But do we all understand what's going on here? We have a leaf. We have a. Let's look at the scale. We got the plant that you see with your eyes. Then there's the leaf that you see with your eyes. Then in the leaf, there's these parts you don't see, the tissues, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. In one, of these, in one of the cells in the tissue, it looks like this. is a plant cell. We've talked about it. If you're confusing this with a prokaryote, you need, some, you need to do some work. You're confused. You have to fix it. That's good that you identified it, but now fix it. In that, in that cell, that eukaryotic cell, there's a, there is an organelle that's called a chloroplast. That's it. This is it. It has five, ma or, uh, five major parts. These are they. Know them. All right, and this is an electron micrograph. This is what it actually looks like if you take a look at it. Obviously, the green, the green one's a drawing. This is what we can see in a, in a, in a microscope, in a very powerful microscope. We see the, the granum, don't we? You see the granum. You see them? Yes. And you can see the thylakoid membranes. You see this space is what? The stroma. The stroma, right? And you can see that there's a membrane outside, there's a membrane just one outside and one inside. The These are the pancakes here. Okay, I see. Okay. So that's good. This, remember, the pancakes are known as granum. This is what the chloroplasts look like 
or, or the cells look like under a microscope, and this is an electron microscope looking at the organelle. So under a light microscope, you can see the plant cells. That's what they look like. They're green for a reason. Let's go take a look. Let's take a little, a little closer look at this story. So again, another look at the chloroplast. There's that granum. And if we take a look at the granum, these are the basic, this is the basic outline. This is an outline of photosynthesis. So look at it. This is a really cool outline. I don't think you have one of these, a, a, a nice drawing like this about this in your book. So I would draw this if I were you. How would I draw this? Well, let's go ahead and sketch it out. So what are we looking at here? What is this? Yes, this is photosynthesis. is good. But what is the structure here? It's one of the thylakoids. It's the, it's, you, you take a thylakoid and you look at it. And it's, you know that stack of that stack of thylakoids called the granum. There's the granum, right? We take the, one of these thylakoids and we and we cut it all in half, and we can look inside. So we're looking at it like we're looking inside an orange, right? And well, how would I draw it if I were you? I'm going to draw it, so there should be no reason why anyone in this room should not is not drawing it. So we would have like one membrane, right? The membrane is is a, is a phospholipid bilayer, right? Look at it, it's a phospholipid bilayer. I'm not going to draw the phospholipid bilayer, though. I'm just going to draw kind of an oval, right? Now, what if you want to? Well, if you want to, go ahead and draw the whole thing. Let's go ahead and draw the whole thing. I mean, if you really, I can see some people are like. All right. Let's not. So you're just, you're just doing a sketch. You know that that's a membrane. It's a cross-section of the membrane. What's the membrane called inside the chloroplast? We call it a thylakoid. So there's your thylakoid membrane. Across the, what, what do you get coming in is sunlight. So light is coming in. And by the way, it's all drawn here, right? Look at it, it's right there. And inside the membrane, inside that, you have this thing called a photosystem. We're going to talk about what the photosystem is. But there's this thing called the photosystem. There's two of them, but we'll talk about it. So there's a photosystem there in the membrane. So where is the where are the light react? We're going to break it up into two different reactions, chemical reactions. When we talk about the photosynthesis reaction, where we take CO2 and water and light and make sugar and oxygen. It's actually many, many different steps. And you have to know these steps. You do. You have to know them. So photosystem, the photosystem's there in the membrane. And inside this whole section, the inside the thalamus, is what happens what we call the light reactions. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to break it up. And this whole week is all about breaking this up in the light reactions, dark reactions. Then we'll look at... Uh, then we'll look at uh, respiration as well. What does that mean by light reaction? Well, again, we'll have to talk about it, right? It's not something I can explain to you. But just, say, just to let you know that we're breaking this up into two parts. One set of reactions requires light. So what do we call those reactions? The light reactions. So that is a short answer. The longer answer is more complicated, and that's what we're going to spend today and tomorrow talking about. So be ready, read your book, because we're going to go quick. So the light reaction, thylakoid, what goes into the re light reactions and what goes out of the light reactions is the question. Good. That's, well, kind of. In, well, yeah, it's a little more complicated than that, but let's, let's, let's say this. One, one thing we know, light goes in for sure. And we know also, you're right, that we get water going in. That's for sure. Light and water. Light, water. See the plus? It's a chemical reaction. And out comes what? Out of the light reaction, what comes out? Oxygen. Oxygen, Oxygen comes out. Right? Do you see any CO2 happening in the light reactions? No. No. No, we don't. We don't see any CO2. So that's interesting. The light reactions is just dealing with water. So we're breaking up that big equation that we talked about earlier. 
right? Photosynthesis, and we're breaking up the pieces. The light reactions are just dealing with water and light and a photosystem, and we're breaking up into oxygen, gas. That's where plants make the oxygen. Now, that oxygen leaves the chloroplast. Some of it's used by the plant cell, but it produces excess oxygen, so the rest of the oxygen leaves the cell. Leaves the, yeah, leaves the plant. Huh? Why is CO2 not written in there? Because it's not used here. It's not used in the light reactions. It is used in, in photosynthesis, you're right, but it's not used in this part of photosynthesis. So we're taking photosynthesis and we're breaking it up into the light reactions, which we're talking about right now, and another set of reactions we call the dark reactions. The dark reactions is a misnomer, so we really shouldn't call them that, but it's, it, it's a bad name for them. We are, another name for them is the light independent reactions. But a lot of us like dark reactions because it's easier, <laughs> right? This is light dependent. That's why we call them the light reactions. Good. Question? Okay. So if there's two reactions, uh, reactants, do they still have the same outcome? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll say this, that this is what, this is photosynthesis. So when we're talking about the light reactions, this is what you need to know. This is photosynthesis. There's no other way of doing it, photosynthesis. No, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm saying like, if it's, you say it's a light and it's a dark, right? Yeah. Do they still have the same outcome? Ah, do they seem to use the same reactants and the same products? No. So they use different products, right? And they produce different things and they bring in different things. You see here, we have waters being used, right? And broken up. By the way, that's what light is used for, to break up water. That's why you need light. It breaks the water, breaks the electrons off of water. It turns into hydrogen ions and oxygen gas. Oxygen gas leaves, the hydrogen ions stay. So that's key, right? That's really, really important. But the, the, what do you think the night reactions or dark reactions are going to be involving? If this is the oxygen and the water and the light, what's the dark reaction going to have? CO2. CO2. And then what's it going to produce? Sugar, right? So you already know what the dark reactions are going to do. The question is how, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad. I'm, I love the way you guys are thinking this morning. All right. And see, reading sometimes helps. You see some of these people asking great questions because they've done their reading. Homework's important. Just let me get to the, the last piece here. So one of the things, there's some other stuff that you haven't heard of yet. We've, we've heard of ADP. What's ADP? That's right. Remember active transport. Remember the sodium potassium pump. ADP is produced when the ATP, the phosphate's removed and the energy's released, right? So ADP is required, and ADP comes from what's called the Calvin cycle. We're going to look at the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is the dark reactions. This is the light independent reactions. Light independent reactions and also known as also known as the dark reactions I, I don't like the dark reactions the title but it's easier than saying light independent reactions I suppose the best way to, the best thing to call is just the Calvin cycle ah close no there is a similar process in cellular respiration called the Krebs cycle so there's a cycle right in the, in, that we'll talk about but right now no Good, good questions. People that have read and kind of have a lot of good questions in their minds. So out of the Calvin cycle comes ADP. What do you think you, you, so if you have ADP, you probably used an ATP, right? What do you think you used ATP to make in the Calvin cycle? Energy. You used energy. You used energy, right? That's what ATP is doing. You used it to make what? Where did you put that energy? Into what molecule? You guys know, oxygen's gone. Is there oxygen being used here at all, you think? No, no. no oxygen's used up here in the light reactions. Carbon dioxide's used to make something. Sugar. That's where that ATP went. It went in to make sugar. So that's why you get energy from sugar. Because you put the energy in from ATP. Question? Yes. Once you take ATP, which is adenosine with three phosphates, 
Once you take, you break that phosphate off, boom, the energy is released. That what's left is ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates on it. That ADP can be recharged like a battery, huh? So the ADP go, in, is required in the light reactions. It has to go. You need ADP to make what? What do you think you're going to make? Uh, light. Well, no, light's not made. Light's used. What are you going to make? ADP is going to be no sugar is made in the light reactions. What comes out of the light reactions if you need ADP? No, oxygen's out. That's already out. Check. Water's come in and used up. Check. ADP's gone in. What's going to come out? If ADP's energy, yes. From what? Somebody said it. ATP. ADP goes in. What comes out? ATP. It's ADP, by the way, plus one phosphate, inorganic phosphate. It's making what? Yeah, that's what's trying. And what's that, where's that ATP going to go? Back in the calm cycle. It's charging up. So it's like that char it's charging it up. That's what it's going. It's going ADP is going into the light reactions to get charged up. And then it takes that energy. Where to get that energy? What's the energy here that we're talking about? ADP. Where's the source of all this energy? Light. 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 The sun. The sun. The sun. Sunlight is the energy for all life on most of the life on earth. Most of the life on earth, it's sun. It's the sun that gives us life. It's what's giving us our, our sugar. Without, without the light, none of this works. Yeah, question? So, you know how you were telling us how over there in California, they had the volcanoes or whatever, and then smoke had came up and it was over them for a couple days. Yeah. So, that means all the plants die, too. So that mean they well, can plants can go a couple days without sunlight. They can survive. They have stored energy, right? They, where do they store that energy? In their roots, right? So, they have sugar. They can last a few days without it. If that volcano would have been big enough to block out the sun for a couple months, then you'd see most of the plant life on this planet die, right? And that's no good. Some plants can, like trees, they can hibernate for, year, for, for a year, for like the winter, right? But when we're talking about uh, no sun for months or a year, or a couple years, now you're talking about most plants dying. Right. And you're hoping that the seeds survive. Right until the sun gets is seen again, but l without light, this photosynthesis can't happen. You can't make any new sugar. You can use up your stored sugar, right? And you know what they're, you know how they're stored. They're stored in starch, right? Because we saw the starch granules in the cells, right? right. So there, that's how they're stored. They're stored, they're stored in uh, in sugar, and so we can use the plants can use that sugar to survive uh, long winters, but after that, that's it. And without the plants, what happens to us? That's it. So uh, let's make sure we all understand this because a lot of people in this world don't get it. We need plants. They don't really need us. We need them. Without them, so when people talk about building and, and progress and all this, without nature, we're done for. Because we cannot survive without them. They produce, not only do they produce the oxygen that we breathe, they produce the food that we eat. And you say, I eat cows. I don't eat plants. I don't know. The cows eat grass. They, they eat plants. All the energy comes from the sun. It starts with plants. and comes down to what we call trophic levels. All right? All right. So let's go on and look at this. So that's ATP. So one other thing that you need to know, and we're going to be talking a lot about in the next few days, is this thing called NADP and NADPH. And there's something very similar in one of the things that the reason you need light, and we're going to talk about a little bit, is that it excites electrons. Except you, you're not a piece of wire. You can't just sit there and just let electrons flow through you and think it's going to work. You need something to carry the electron. Something has to carry the electron from one place to the other. And these, one of these carriers, you're going to have to know three of them, all right? By the time you're done, you'll have to know three electron carriers. The, one of them that you have to know, that's the, one that, the one that's used in photosynthesis is called NADP. So NAD plus is an electron carrier. You know what an electron is. Yep, yep. And it's an electron, electron carrier. You see why we went through all the trouble of going through that earlier in the year? Because I knew it was coming. 
We're going to use electron carriers, and that's NADP, NADP+. Plus. Do not ask me what it stands for. You will not like the answer. So just know, know what it is, NADP+. Plus. When it's carrying an electron, that's when it's not carrying, not carrying electron, no electron. I'm going to put no electron if that's okay. When it doesn't have an electron, I'm going to just put a little E with a minus sign. Is that okay? A circle. No electron, it's NADP. When it has the electron, it's NADPH. Why the H? Because when it has an electron, the H sticks to it like a magnet, right? So you have NADPH. So there you have it. That's your electron carriers. When it's no electron and with, with electron, all right? So obviously it's what goes in to get the high energy electron. What goes in to get the high energy electron? Which one's going in? Let me use a different color. NADP. NADP. NADP plus, probably. Let's, can we use the word, the number plus? Let me use a different color. Uh, let's use this turquoise. So in comes NADP plus, and out comes what? NADPH. NADPH. And that's carrying the electron. Where's, it get, where's that electron going to be needed? That high energy electron going to be needed? It's, this is all in the plants, but where is it going to be needed? Which of these two? Into the Calvin cycle. It needs to go in here. So we need all the energy we can get going into the Calvin cycle because we want to take that molecule of sugar. That sugar is high energy. We need to put all that energy into sugar. So what it does, you take all that sunlight and you break it up. You, put, you jam it into ATP. You jam the sunlight into NADPH. And now you've got these high energy molecules. They're like little vibrating little spheres of goodness. And they go right into this thing here called the Calvin cycle where you're going to take a bunch, six CO2s, all this energy, and you're going to produce a sugar molecule. Boom! There it is, ready for you to eat. And as soon as you eat it, that's how we get energy. When you go to eat an apple, this is what you're eating. You're eating sunlight. You're eating sunlight. It's been changed into chemical energy, right? But it's the same energy that came from the sun. It's there. You're eating it. It's vibrating and it's juicy and it's in your blood. And if you, your body can take it. Now you can use it to move and breathe and think and love and hate, right? All that stuff comes from the sun, originally. What's what? He said pasta. What did he say? Pasta. Oh, pasta. It has sugar in it. That's the point. All right. Always one comedian in the group. By the way, what are what when you says organic molecules, the reason it says organic molecules and not sugar is because it actually produces not a six carbon sugar, but a three carbon sugar that can then be used to make all kinds of things. Like it doesn't have to be used for food, it could be used to make cellulose, which is the structural parts of the plant, but it, that's why we call them organic molecules, okay? But remember, cellulose is made of sugar, so still. Yeah. Is there what now? I mean, it depends on what you mean by too much for what? The purpose, right? So too much energy could produce fire, right? So if you have too much sunlight, too much energy, it's called it, the excess. It starts to break up the organic molecules and it turns into fire. We don't want that unless you're cold and you want to burn some wood for fire, right? So... Too much depend for photosynthesis. Is there too much sunlight for photosynthesis? No. I, it depends. Like I said, the intensity of the light, if it gets too hot, it could be too much for it. But in general, in nature, no. Right? Are we good? Yeah. All right, so let's go on. Now we're going to take, we're, see, this is just an outline. As crazy as this all was, I hope you do it up. Of course, I'll, I'll, I'll post it. But... This is just an outline. Now we're going to look in, the, in depth into each of these. Let me record this. So let's think about this. You, gotta, you, you have to be able to put this stuff together, right? So there's CO2. That's going into the plant, right? Let's draw a leaf. It's going into the plant. And then it's stoma, right? And uh, water's coming up, right? Water, H2O. 
And out is coming, out of this is coming oxygen gas, right? We know that. And we know that the oxygen gas is actually, actually the oxygen gas is coming from water, right? We also know that because we saw the light reactions broke up water into hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions stayed over here, and there's two of them, right, for every water molecule. There's two hydrogen ions for every water molecule. And then oxygen, so you're actually going to have four hydrogen ions, and you're going to need... I mean, think about it, right? If you're going to make O2, look at O2. How many oxygens does water have? Could you look at it? No, it's only one. One oxygen. Oh, Guys, you got... Oh, try not... To, here, this is a mistake. Look, it sounds funny, and I'm really ready to laugh with you, too. I haven't had my second cup of coffee, but, yeah, I'm ready to laugh with you, too. But here's the problem. This is the same stuff you do on the test, right? You jump. The answer is right, literally right in front of you, right? How many oxygens are there? Mm -hmm. Only one. Mm -hmm. Don't jump. This is not a race. This is not a race. When you're on a test, don't jump at answers. Think it through. How many oxygens in a water molecule, in a water molecule? One. How many hydrogens in a water molecule? Two. 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 Okay. How many oxygens in oxygen gas. Two. So how many water molecules do you need to make this one oxygen molecule? Two. Two, because you need two of these. And, there's a, and you can't change this, so you need two of them. We call this balancing equation, but we're not, we don't need to worry about that. You need two of these. Do you agree? Yes. So when we break two of these up, we're going to end up with four hydrogens. And then we get the two oxygens, and two oxygens leave. Two hydro, four hydrogen ions. Do you agree with that? Okay, so that's, that's it. That's simple enough, I think. So now the question that I have, then the question then becomes, if you have CO2 coming in, and it, what, what's the other thing that's coming out by the, besides oxygen? No, carbon dioxide is going in. And I think, now this is again, I'm going to say again, you guys think, read, look, don't jump. The CO2 is doing what? Coming in. Coming in. So this stuff is going... Out. So oxygen is going out. What's the other thing that's coming out of the reaction? Not out of the leaf, what? out of the reaction. Uh, what is photosynthesis uh, making? Oxygen? Sugar, sugar. Sugar, sugar. And what is and what's glucose? Sugar. Sugar. And what's the what's the formula for glu glucose? C6 H12 O6. And I told you guys make sure you knew that because you're going to see it over and over again. I told you that way back in August. So this is, so how many carbons are in sugar? Six. There's six of them. And where do the carbons come from? We said the air, but what specifically, what part of the air specifically? <clears throat> did, it, uh, did it come from the oxygen? Did it come from the nitrogen? Did it, the, uh, the, what part of the air, the air is a gas, right? Uh -huh. Don't keep saying sun. I don't understand why. <laughs> why here. So air... Sun is not the answer. You're not thinking. This is back to the question. You're not thinking, right? So you got air. Air is made of what? We talked about it. Nitrogen gas, mostly. It's made of carbon dioxide gas. And it's made of oxygen gas. And it has a bunch of other stuff like argon gas and et cetera. I'm not even going to put the simple, so I'm just going to say other stuff which will be important later on, but right now it's other gases. That's air. It's a mixture. It's a solution, right? It's a homogeneous solution of gases. We breathe in. Mostly we breathe in nitrogen, but we don't use the nitrogen. It comes right back out. We do breathe in some carbon dioxide. It's there. When you take a deep breath, carbon dioxide is going in with it. But what is the gas that we're trying to get as animals? We're trying to get anim as animals, we're trying to get oxygen. All right, so now back to the question. You already told me that the carbon and sugar comes from air. You already said that. Specifically, what gas in air does the carbon come from? Carbon dioxide. How many carbon dioxides do you need to make one glucose molecule? Six. Six. Thank you. That's what I was getting at. You can, could you, you need enzymes to do this. So you need special enzymes. The plants have the enzymes. You could, could we make glucose using these enzymes in a test tube? Yes. 
right. Bacteria do it. Uh, plants do it. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's done it in the lab, but I'm sure it's possible. Okay? I'm sure it's possible. All right, so we're good? That's what this meant. Now, how did we discover these things and what did we discover? Well, when do you think, let me ask you, this is really interesting. When do you think the first time we discovered, like, okay, so we're, we're a bunch of cave people walking around. We're eating vegetables and fruits that we like, right? And we're, we have a society going. There's a leader, let's call Abbas, the leader, he's our leader. <laughs> hey, it's all right. You know, don't fight with the leader because then you'll get thrown out of the clan, right? So the clan's walking around. We're walking around, uh, and we're and Abbas is our leader, and he's like, you know, he's telling you to go hunt. He's telling you to wash the dishes, and you don't like it, but you got to do it, right? So we're going. So do you think those guys understood photosynthesis? No. Do you think what did they? What do you think they thought of? When was they the first? They thought the world was flat. The, well, maybe, maybe not. I don't even. Th I don't think they even. Honestly, I, if you think about it, would you really care if the world was flat or round? If you were, if you were a, a caveman, no. I wouldn't care. The only thing I care about is where's our next meal coming from, right? How do we get? How do we get our food? Because we're hungry. So did they eat the plants? So they, yeah, they ate plants, and of course you had to have your wise people, right? Your teachers. Because what are some plants? What are they to us? Poisonous, right? So we have to have some, somebody in our, in our group here. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's somebody a boss is designated to be the, food, the taster, the local taster. Has to go out and make sure that the food doesn't kill us. So if they eat it, they're like, and they die, then we know we don't eat that. So if, 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 is that what they be doing to animals, like when they taste yeah, us on animals? Yeah, we used to taste. We used to test it on ourselves, right? But then we said, "Wait a minute, this is not too smart. Let's test it on animals." So, well, let's let's keep going, guys. Yes, you can, but you it's it's complicated. Yes, they are alive, and we could test them on plants, but they wouldn't do us any good. The things that kill plants don't necessarily kill us, right? So we're worried about things that kill us, right? So a boss is the leader. He's going to pick who's going to be the taster. Of course, I don't want to be the taster, so I'm going to be a boss's friend. Your, his enemies will be the tasters, and we'll see what happens. So anyways, moving on, that's what cavemen were, were thinking about. Now let me ask you, when do you think was the first time we really started thinking about what photosynthesis is? What time? Think, it. just make a guess. I mean, there's no way for you to know, right? Well, let's make a guess, go ahead. Nick, I, I can't say names because we're recording, but go ahead, tell me, make a guess. Like since the earth began, you think we've been thinking about photosynthesis? No. Okay. I mean, yeah, because we have plants. You think 1890s? Okay. That's there's a eight. There's no wrong answer here. There's no wrong answer. Let me tell you, this person again. I don't want to say this because we're recording. This person is actually kind of correct. We've been thinking about nature and the cycles of nature for a very long time. The ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, the ancient people. The carbon in sugar that plants make come from carbon dioxide, yes. Does that make sense? Yes. You said the carbon Okay, so today what we're going to look at is the light, uh, the role of light in photosynthesis. What exactly does light do? Yeah, it does give it energy. The question is what does it really do and how does it do it? And you can see here, and you have these same reactions discussed in your, uh, in your book, except that here they talk about what some light photosynthesizing bacteria do that are not plants, that don't use chlorophyll. And there is a bacteria, there are bacteria, that what they do is instead of taking water apart, this is the first time uh, this guy, Niles, or Nile, Van Nile, at Stanford University. This is the, this is the guy right here that did it. What he did is he looked at a bacteria that took CO2. It's still taking CO2. It's still making sugar. But instead of using water, it uses sulf uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide. To us, this H2S is poisonous. But to this bacteria, it takes H2S and treats it like plants treat water. And what they do is they take light, 
CO2, they mix it together, and what they produce is water, they produce water, a sugar, and sulfur solid. So really, you get this sulfur yellow powder falling out of solution, and then you get water, and, you, and it also produces this, this sugar. So it's an interesting reaction, but what do you notice is very similar when we look at this? What, what, could we, what could we do when we look at this, and do you see any similarities to the photosynthesis that we learned about or started to learn about? What's the similarity? Uh, You're using CO2, so that's good. So we, we do, we're still using CO2. They still use CO2. They still use light. Very good. And it's even more similar, if you think about this, it's H and the 2 are the same. The difference is, is instead, of the, instead of H2S, we, plants use H2O. H2O. And a lot of uh, bacteria also use H2O, but it's interesting that it's chemically, it's very similar. So what he said is, what if we looked at photosynthesis as, as CO2, right? Uh, CO2 plus some kind of H2 something, right? Because it, it could use a lot of different, uh, this, is not a, this is not an element, this is a, this is a variable. All right. What if we looked at something as H2 something plus carbon dioxide plus light energy is going to lead us to, to make some kind of sugar, right? Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. So he looked at that, and then, of course, we look at here. Instead of producing water, uh, this other, he looked at some other organisms that did different kinds of chemical reactions. But all of these reactions, they're all taking light, and they're, they're, they're super energizing these electrons. Could you stay after class today? I want to talk to you. And, and what they're doing is they're involved in, in moving these electrons around the system and producing this high-energy molecule that we call sugar, right? So let's take a look at something we call carbon fixation. So this is a part of the problem here. So let's make a little list of things. Uh, light, we know. Light, number one, we know light. We use it uh, increases the energy of electrons. And that's number one, that's A, that's what light does. And the other thing is, the, the other thing you can learn from this, uh, from this slide is, how do we take CO2 gas, how do we take CO2 gas, and then take it and turn it, and, and stop it being gas and put it in a chain of carbons? Because that's what we're talking about when we're talking about making sugars. It's taking carbon and oxygen, the COs, right, and the H's, and we're gonna put them together, in some kind of, of uh, in some kind of chain, right? So how do we do that? And we're not going to look at specifics, but how do you take this CO two? And it's in gas that we breathe out. And how do we make this long chain of carbons with uh, oxygens and hydrogens connected to it? How do we do that? All right? How do we do that? How do we get that out of there? So the taking the carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into organic molecule, combining them with other carbon dioxides, because that's what we're doing, taking one carbon dioxide, one carbon. Because how many carbons are in carbon dioxide? There's only one in carbon dioxide. It has four, carbon has, makes four bonds, but it only is only one carbon in carbon dioxide. There it is, it's yellow, there it is. And we take that carbon dioxide and we link them like Lego blocks to another carbon from another carbon dioxide. And then we take link another carbon dioxide out and we make this long chain of carbons, you see? And I stopped at three, but you know, you can make, and sugar has six, right? Because sugar has, you saw it on the test today, sugar has C6H12O6. And so sugar, glucose has six of them. Ribose has only five carbons, right? But we link them all to these carbons together. This process, 
this process of linking them together, taking the CO2 out of the air and putting them together into this organic, you see this here, we call it an organic molecule. Why is it organic? Not because it's natural, man. No. Because there's carbon and there's oxygen, right? Carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, so we call it what? Organic. organic. So the chemistry of carbon is, or, is, is organic uh, chemistry. And what we call this process of, of linking and taking CO2 out of the air, out of air, and putting it into this, fixing it, right? Because when it's in air, it's bouncing around like a maniac. But taking it and gluing it down, fixing it, we call it, interestingly enough, carbon, what? Fixation. So it's just that simple. Carbon fixation is just taking it out of the air and linking them together into an organic molecule, specifically some kind of sugar, right? So organic molecules, some kind of sugar. Those are kind of the two big things that work up when we can move forward through this process. That's what you have to keep in mind. If you don't keep it in mind, you're, you're going to get lost. So when we're talking about photosynthesis, you're taking in the light reactions. We talked about it yesterday. You're, where, where are the light reactions happening? Hopefully somebody says, is at least thinking the phthalocoids. All right. And the light reactions, we're going to look at it in more detail, but the light reactions are taking light. It's breaking up water. Instead of H2S, it's going to break up H2O. And you're going to produce two hydrogen ions, and you're going to produce oxygen gas. And it's going to take in AT ADP and phosphate. It's going to make ATP. And it's going to send NADPH to the, and it's to the Calvin cycle. It's going to send ATP, ADP to, uh, ATP to the Calvin cycle, right? And it's, going to, and it's going to send the high energy electrons and NADPH to the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle is going to fix the CO2. It's the Calvin cycle that fixes the CO2. All right. Where the light reactions, what they do is they increase the electrons. They increase the, uh, uh, the electrons' uh, energy, and you make a little ATP and an ADPH. All right. Yeah, I'll tell you when it's time to go. So uh, we, so that, keep that in mind. You should be working on Chapter 8. By tomorrow, we're going to move through, finish photosynthesis tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we're doing respiration. And Thursday, we're going to be looking at photosynthesis and respiration again. Yeah. That's, that's an older age, right? Above that, uh, yeah, that's just, this is just a sketch. It's not a real molecule. But yeah, you make these molecules that have carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. Remember, what, is it, what does a carbohydrate have? Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. I will have these tests graded next time. Ladies, sit down, please, and thank you. I don't understand why people are putting stuff away before I dismiss the class. I appreciate you not putting it away. Yes, I see the people that haven't put anything away. I appreciate you. I dismiss the class, not your own whatever is going on. Thank you. For those of you that were polite and listened for your sake, listen to what we're going over. For those of you that were impolite, learn, be learn better manners. Put away your things and go on and get to class. This is new stuff. So in biophysics, and you have to think about what is what do I mean by biophysics? Well, light is not alive, right? Light is just energy. It's not just energy. It is energy. It's an important part of energy. It's part of the universe, right? But that's not, light is not really, like, there are no cells made of light, right? The, but light is important to plants because that's where the source of energy for life comes from. So the study of biophysics is the study of how does light and how do other things that are really in the realm of physics, which is what we call physical sciences, non-living science, right? Things like gravity, things like light, electricity, how does that fit into biology? Because we are living creatures that live in this universe, right? And so we take advantage of electricity and light and chemicals. Even though this is in chemistry, there's still chemicals here because we're made of chemicals. We live in this universe. We're not like these 
other universe beings that don't have to interact with these chemicals or physics. All right, so when we look at biophysics and we look at the energies in a photon, the energy in a photon, the question is, how do we get, the, you know, there's, a, there's just always this question that comes up. When you have light, how do you get light to turn into ATP? How does that happen? Right? ATP is a molecule. You, saw, you drew it. You should have done it. Hopefully you did that one already, that homework assignment already. You should have drawn ATP. You should have drawn ADP. You should see ADP going, turning into ATP. Right? You should know that. In fact, I was helping some students yesterday during advisory with that homework assignment, and we talked a little bit about it. That's why I wish I would have more of those conversations. So how do we get ADP, which is, and by the way, if you haven't done it, pay extra attention because that's what, you'll have to draw it. I'm not going to draw ADP and ATP, but there it is. ADP, which is what? What is ADP? A dead name? So let's just say adenine. I don't know how to spell it. Let's just call it that. And it's, it's good, close. It's diphosphate. So there's two phosphates on it. Two, and I just draw it like this. This is a standard way of drawing phosphate. But phosphate is a phosphorus atom with four oxygens. We looked at it when we looked at DNA, didn't we? And it was a phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone. Do you remember that conversation, right? And remember that uh, being on a test, right? And so this is actually the A in... ATGC, right, in, in the DNA sequence. This is the A, adenine. And in DNA, it's only adenine with one phosphate because it's part of a chain. But when you have ADP, it's, it's as energy, it does have energy it can give off, but it doesn't have enough to be really useful. So we need to put more, it needs more energy. So it turns out that when you take and add a phosphate, right, to it, you get adenine again, still the same molecule. Again, the homework has you draw out the molecule, which is useful, but I'm not going to have you memorize how to draw the molecule out, okay? What is important to me, though, is that you understand that there's this nucleic, uh, nucleic acid, right, nitrogenous base. Remember that? Okay. So the nitrogenous base, A, that has a phosphate, and in fact, there, it has... It has three phosphates on it, and when you, have, when you put three phosphates, the energy goes up. You need energy to do that. That molecule now is vibrating with energy. All right, it's just vibrating. It's just like, oh my God, I'm so pumped up. It's like somebody that drank like 18 Red Bulls. You're ready to go, right? And as soon as it reaches its a reactive center, boom, the phosphate comes out and the energy is transferred. And you lose a lot of energy to heat. So the more molecules, the more energy. The more phosphates, the more energy on the ATP. Yeah, it's, it's not the same process, but it's. I want you to have that image, right? And where this in the image here, ADP is this really medium level energized molecule, right? So it needs more energy to be useful. So it needs that third phosphate. What do we call that when it has three phosphates on it? ATP, right? So it need, we need to turn this ADP into ATP. And the way it happens is that light comes in. And we'll talk about the process is a little more complicated than that. But the light comes in, it energizes an electron. And that allows for another phosphate to be added to this. There's a plus there. So ADP plus a phosphate plus some energy. And in fact, I'm going to get rid of light because it's not really directly light, by the way. You'll see why. You'll see why. What I mean in a minute. It's hard to... But we need energy. It's not going to be directly light because it's hard to change light into chemical energy. It's not like... You, can you stand outside and, and look up to the sun and get energized? No, you can't. Yeah, well, a lot of people wish. In fact, there was a scientist, I think it was in the 80s, that took chloroplast and injected his skin with chloroplast. He was, he was hoping that they would... Did it make chloroplast? He was hoping it would make ATP for him, right? What? Uh, it didn't work. Nothing happened. I don't know if it killed him or what, but I don't, I don't remember, but it didn't work. I thought it would kill him. Yeah, you would think. But that was really weird. 
So energy, uh, you need energy to make ATP, and th there's a whole process to it. But the question comes up, well, how does light, how does light to energize an electron? Because I, I keep telling you that what light does is that it energizes an electron. Well, there's this guy, this real famous guy. In fact, uh, he's so famous that a lot of physics is named after him. And his name is Max Planck. Yeah. Oh, the, a lot of stuff like there's a, there's the Planck constant. There are companies named after him. There's people uh, I don't know people named their sons after. I would name my son Planck or Max Planck. Or, you would, you said. Well, it's a German name, but if I were German, I guess I would love to have I would love to be associated with this guy because he's really smart. He was really smart, and he did a lot of really fundamental physics work. Like, his work, he's, he, and this other guy that I'm sure you've heard his name, Hertz. Oh, yeah, like the car? Well, okay, the rental car company is Hertz, yeah, but. Like the fool? The fool? Yeah, yeah, it's fool. Yeah, yeah, it's fool. It's salad. It says Hertz on it. And it's pretzel. That's what I'm on, right? right? No, we talking no, about Hertz. Hertz. They got that, too. I know what you're talking about. They got it. It's too what? I don't know. Sometimes I just have to sit here and just <laughs> All right, so Hertz, and maybe you haven't heard of it, is you've heard of voltage, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so there's another measurement of frequency that we call Hertz. Oh. And so Hertz is, is named after this guy, Hertz. And uh, there's a, another real, real bright guy. I'm not writing it. There's another real bright guy. That's named, right? Albert, Albert, Albert Einstein. Einstein. He, he got his Nobel Prize. A lot of people think he got his Nobel Prize for relativity. And he did. I think he did end up getting one for relativity. But he got his Nobel Prize for describing how electrons get energy from light. We call this the photoelectric effect. So, and there's how you spell it. I don't want to write it because it's right here Why I write it. There it is. Photoelectric effect. So photo meaning what? Picture. 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 But what is a picture really associated with? Color. Light. Light. Oh, yeah. Photo actually means light. What is it? That's what photo means. And a lot of people think a photo is an uh, is, is image. Uh, image, but a photo actually means light, which makes sense. That if you take a picture, naming a picture a photo makes sense because photo actually means light. Okay, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So you know those older like cameras where it would like uh like it would like print out like there. So with the flash, um, why was it like when they printed it out the flat it would be like the flash before the um before the picture came out? Well, that happens still if you're in a dark room. That's a complicated answer to that. It has to do with the the design of the camera, right? It's not because of the it, of the special uh, paper that was uh, sensitive to light that printed right away. Well, I just thought it was like the flash, like it's just it needed light. You need light, and it needed extra light to take because if you if the camera's flash goes off, it's just because there's not enough light for the aperture of the camera to make to get the image, and that that becomes a whole list a whole line, a whole discussion, right? That's going to lead to a whole discussion of me trying to explain to you how a camera works, and I don't want to do that right now. But we can do it during advisory after class, after school if you'd like. Yes? Well, back to what you said a while ago, like how to look at something, it's like, depends on the color you see it as, the light is reflecting the color. Yeah. So how would that go with a camera? Is what we see, like, you know how somebody take a picture, right? Is it still what we see when the light comes to the color? I can't tell you how amazing the questions that you're asking are, and I wish we had time for me to get into it, right? Because they're, they're amazing. They, have, they go into some of the fundamental ways that we perceive nature, and they're also uh, fundamental ways of how, how things work, okay? So they're really important questions. The problem is that we really have to try to streamline our conversations because we're running out of time, right? No. I couldn't. I'd have to spend the whole class discussing this, and I don't want to. That's what happened yesterday at 7 o'clock. We spent the whole class discussing tectonic plates, but that didn't help us get ready for the test, right? So trying to stay focused here, okay? 
So they, so these guys, these famous guys, Hertz and Planck and Einstein, during their time, right, which was in the 40s. Now, now this was 1901, 1902, the 18, 1918s, and Einstein was around in the in the 40s. He helped, you know, the, there's the whole nuclear era was probably in part started because of these guys as well, because they. They defined all the all the all the knowledge that we have, really, at least the base knowledge of, uh, of atoms and energy. So Max Planck and Einstein, and these guys, what they came up with this idea that light acts as both a particle and a wave. Do you need to know this for a test? No, but it's interesting. So when you see sunlight, what you see, and this is going to partially answer your question. When you see sunlight or any light, what you're seeing is energy moving in a wave like this. That's why I draw light like this when you see me draw it. All right? But it's also a particle. It also acts like a particle. So we call a wave of light, a single wave of light, a photon. Photon. It's a particle of light. Right? So that's a photon. Both. Both. They're not the same thing, but they are. It has properties of both. Light has properties of both. They act like a, a wave, and light also acts like a particle. So it's confusing. I don't have time to discuss it. I'm going to stop there with that. With all this really beautiful knowledge about. Yeah. So if you like, you might be on the freeway and you see, like you see the light coming down from the sun. You're looking at a sun ray, so that's that, that's not it's not too far off. You can think of that, think of a sun ray, that beam of light, right? That's a beam of light. There's a lot of photons in that beam, a lot of particles. They're all kind of think of like a billion trillion little particles of streaming, shooting at like bullets. You can think of a photon like a bullet, but it's a bullet that's moving like this. So moving in a way. You can't see it when you're naked. There are, we have some experiments we could talk about. We just don't have time. All right. So that's a photon. So the question is, what, how do you get that light to interact with matter? Well, what happens is that matter is made of what? You learned it in this class. What is a matter made of? An atom. And, and the center of the atom has protons and neutrons, right? And out in the outskirts of the atom are what? Electrons. So they're sitting there, and there's levels, right? And you can talk about it, but we're not going to talk about it. You can worry about that when you get to chemistry. So that this photon is going to come in. When, it, when this photon comes in, and it hits an electron, boom, hits this electron. What happens, and let's say it doesn't hit that one. Let's say it hits this one here. What happens is this electron literally jumps up. It moves. It starts vibrating. It moves up. Very high energy. It goes from low to high. Low to high energy because of this electron, because of this light. Huh? And now, yeah, but it's not, right? So, because it's not really, tra it's not transported across the membrane, so let's not confuse that. But it's moving from low energy to high energy. That high energy can now be given to something else. You've just turned light into some kind of chemical energy. Because now this electron can do what? What do electrons do with atoms, in atoms? What do they create? When you have one carbon, another carbon, what holds the two carbons together? No. Duh. Do you see hydrogen here at all? No. So what holds the two carbons together? A bond. What's a bond? In, the ca in this case, between two carbons, anyways. It's not a relationship. That's not, no. Specifically, you learned it in August, you learned it, you went over in September. A sharing of what? Electrons. So when you get the high energy electrons, now you can make, you, now you can share electrons, or you can break them apart. You can also break them apart. Let's take a look at what happened. What do you think happens when you have water, H2O, so that's one hydrogen sharing electrons with another hydrogen, sharing it over here with this one. What happens when that light comes in under the right circumstances with the right enzymes, comes in and hits this electron? What do you think is going to happen to the bond here? 
This becomes high energy. What's going to happen to the bond? It's going to break. And you're going to get the electrons going, going one way, and it usually goes with the bigger atom, right? In this case, oxygen. And what you're going to get is two hydrogen ions. Why is there a plus? Because it lost its electron. And you get an oxygen with a negative two charge. Extra, some extra electrons, right? High energy electrons, ready to go. So that's why these, this then combines with another oxygen to form what? Two oxygens to get, coming together, forming what? A double bond with oxygen, and this is oxygen gas, O2 gas. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, when we're saying, hey, light comes in and interacts with water, breaks water up, and, and ele excites electrons, makes them more high energy. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. No, no, that just encourages them to form bonds, break bonds apart. You, you, when it, what happens when you put a lot of energy into stuff? Let's make it a, see, what's an example of putting a lot of energy into stuff? Okay. Okay, let's think of chemistry. Let's think I have a steak, protein. Steak, protein, and fat, maybe some sugar in there. I take that steak and I put it on a pan. Then I take a flamethrower and I burn the steak. I, I burn it. I, I just take the flame and just... <laughs> what happens when I add all that energy? I, it's already dead. It's a steak. We, 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 already killed, we already killed the steak. We chopped it up. That cow's long dead. We chopped it up. We put it on a pan. That cow's not saying moo while it's on the pan, is it? So I sit down in the pan and I take a flamethrower and I... I burn it. I change it chemically. Why? Because the bonds, the electrons get so excited, they start jumping around. And then they just like die. It's, I don't know why we keep saying die. These are not alive. These bonds jump around and they change. Remember we talked about what a chemical reaction was. The atoms change. They exchange each other. So now instead of having hydrogen... Connected the two, uh, to an oxygen, two hydrogens connected to an oxygen. Now we get hydrogen ions all by themselves and two oxygens connected. Why did that chemical reaction happen? Because the electrons were energized. Otherwise, water doesn't do that by itself. You don't have a glass of water making oxygen, do you? No, no it doesn't. You don't have that happening by itself. You need, it needs energy. And this is how it happens with enzymes. It can't do it without enzymes. We'll talk about enzymes later a little more. So we talked about light already. We talked about the absorption spectrum, right, the wavelengths. Let's take a look at chlorophyll. Let's take a look at this chlorophyll diagram. Now here's this diagram of chlorophyll. It turns out there's not just chlorophyll. It's not just the pigment. Remember we, said, we talked about pigments? Do you remember that? So the pigment, it's not just pigments. The pigment, there's more than one pigment. Rather, it's not just chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, there's chlorophyll B, and then there's carotenoids. What are carotenoids? Yeah, well, they are found in carrots, I guess. That's, but that's not really the point. That's not really the point. It doesn't matter what they are. But what, are, what do we know they are? What do we know they are? What's important here? What's important? They're what? They're, that's it. It's a pigment. That's what's important. That's what's important. The three pigments, not just one pigment. There's three of them. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and chlorophyll and carotenoids. There's more than three, but these are the three we're going to talk about. Are we clear? So they're different colors, right? So chlorophyll A is when you see this line go up. You see this line going up. Let's analyze this diagram. Another weak point for a lot of students is. How do I read this? This is confusing, right? That's what people tell me. So let's analyze this. What's on the X? So that's how long that wave is, right? I think I, I, I told you. What's a wave? This, right? How long is that wave? A long, long wave. Well, it's not. They're actually very short. But let's go ahead. How long is 
a wave. A wave is measured from either crest to crest, so from here to the next crest. Right. Somebody close the door. So from here to here is a wavelength. This is what this is how we represent wavelength with this lambda symbol. So that's a wavelength. The different wavelengths you call you call those different wavelengths color. So that's how your eye sees. That's what your eye sees. When you see red, that's a wavelength that's around the 700 nanometers. That's a, nanometers is a small measurement, a meter, very small meter. So very small division of a meter. Okay. So 700 nanometers, that's the length of one photon wave, one wave of red light. You see there's, many, there's a few different wavelengths that equal red. Our eyes can't really tell the difference between every, free, every nanometer of light, but we can tell different reds. This is a little pink, this is a little redder, this is, you know, whatever. Hold on. Do, every question needs to wait until I'm done. Thank you and hold on to it. So... Where you see this red light, there's also blue light. Remember Roy G. Bib? Red, Roy G. Bib, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So this is kind of a more purplish. So there's your rainbow. And when we're looking at wavelengths, this chlorophyll A doesn't, you see these, this goes up. What is the Y? The light absorption. Light absorption. So... This chlorophyll A, what's its favorite light to absorb? Let's follow it. Let's follow it. Does it like blue? Yeah. Yes, it does. There it is. It likes blue. It doesn't really like violet that much. Not, none of the really, none of the pigments do a lot of good violet stuff. But blue, yeah, it's good. Does it do light blue? No. Not well. Does it do green? No. Not at all. In fact, what pigment does green in a plant? None of them. None of them do green well at all. Look at them. All three of these lines do what? And that's why plants are green to our eyes, right? Because none of them are being absorbed. In fact, very, uh, there's a little yellow in the green too because it's not really, the plants don't really do well in absorbing yellow either, do they? Yeah. So, I'm, a, I'm trying to get there. If you could just follow. We, you guys, I, when you were kids, did you sit there? Your mom was telling you a story. You're like, well, what happened to the bear? I'm like, I'm not done yet. Didn't your mom, how, did your mom tell you the end of the story before you, she told you the middle? I mean, come on. We got, I got to tell you. I got to explain it. Listen. Oh, Lord. It's like. Oh. All right. So here are the colors, okay, that the plants can't absorb. But then we come over here, again, we're talking about chlorophyll A, right? So what happens over here uh, in the reds? What's, what is chlorophyll A really good at doing? Absorbing. Absorbing red. So it, a lot of the red goes away from plants because it absorbs it. Uh, here's another one over here that does a real good job at blue, right? Yep. Okay. So that's the same chlorophyll. The pigment is really good at absorbing light, uh, dark blue. It's really good at absorbing red. But there's a lot of other light that the plant could take advantage of, right? Yeah. So it has another pigment, chlorophyll B. That's this dotted line. Let's look at it. Dashed line, whatever you want to call it. Oh, let's call them dots. And it's really good at blue, isn't it? Yeah. It takes up a lot more blue than the A did because it starts taking it up around here, around 400 nanometers. It goes all the way to about 500, does it well, maybe 520, right? So chlorophyll, uh, this chlorophyll, chlorophyll B, does a pretty good job at blue. And it gets some of the orange, doesn't it? Yeah. It gets some of the orange, a little bit of the red, but mostly orange. And it does get a little bit of uh, the yellow. So it's really light orange, uh, dark yellow, uh, most of the orange, and some of the blue, some of the red. And then, of course, the carotenoids, uh, this, this carotenoid here, look at this. It covers what? Most of the blue again. So really, the blue is gone, man. Uh, there's really, there's a lot of absorption of blue. The green, it has a little bit of the dark green, but then that's it. It's over. The green doesn't, is not really absorbed at all, and none of the yellow still. And then we follow it. We keep following it, and it's actually it's done at green. It doesn't absorb any of the red so if our eyes, or orange. So if our eyes could have seen the green, the plants would actually be looking like blue? No, we're not. No, no, let's not jump around. So let's, let's think. Let's think. 
You guys got to think. So this, these pigments together, all three of them together, are absorbing most of the blue, so you don't see it at all. You absorb most of the red and most of the orange, and what you're left with is yellow and green, and that's why you get the green pig, the plants that are green, because that's the light that's not absorbed, so it's reflected back to our eye. All the other frequencies, all the other wavelengths are absorbed, right, by these pigments. What pigments? Chlor carotenoids, chlorophyll, and chlorophyll A. Now the question came up, it's a good question, I plan to answer it, is why do leaves change color in the fall? So that's a really good... Uh, hold on a second. Question. This is, uh, you know what, before we answer that, let me, let me go ahead and let's talk a little bit more about what chlorophylls are. Just enough. So chlorophyll is found in these photosystems, and this is what chlorophyll looks like. It looks, it almost looks like an antenna to me. Does it look like an antenna to you? No. You never it's seen those big so antennas? Small. Like, you know, not like an antenna, no. like a rod, like those big radio antennas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to pick up satellite, like a satellite dish. Collect satellite. Yeah, it's collect satellite dishes are antennas. They collect uh, satellite signals, yeah, right? right? Not like an antenna in a car or anything, right. but like an antenna, like a big wide one. All right. Yeah, I get you. So this tail, this, what do you think? Why does it have a hydrocarbon tail? Why does it have a nonpolar tail? Where is it going to go? Where's the nonpolar tail going to go? Where's the not? Oh my God! Does nonpolar go with water? No. It goes in a cell what? Membrane. It goes in a cell membrane. So that's why it has a tail. So it sticks in this membrane. So here, this part is not, it's, it, this part is actually, it's called the porphyrin head, and it sticks out on the surface of the membrane. What membrane? Membrane of what? Phospholipid. It's a phospholipid membrane of what organelle? Plant. Plant, a plant is not an organelle. The what organelle would chlorophyll and carotenoids be found in? Chloroplast. Chloroplast. There it is. So... In the membrane of the chloroplast, what part of the chloroplast? What membrane? The thalacoid. There you go. And, oh my God, it's drawn right here for you. Thalacoid. No. The thalacoid, yeah, that's, that's these membranes here. The, the stack of pancakes, that's right, it's like a pancake, and the stack is called the granum. But in that membrane, that little piece, is, you take a look at this little box here, and... This is a cutout of it, and in the membrane is this pigment that we oh, call that's chlorophyll. That's what this is. This is pigment. You see it? There it is. So this is one molecule of this. This is one. This is another one. This is another one. So they're all in the membrane. Are we clear? Yes. So these are all ready to go to collect sunlight, to absorb all those, all those wavelengths we talked about. So why, again, is it that plants change color, well, their leaves change color in the fall when the leaves start dying out? Well, let's think about it. One of these uh, experiments, again, I wish we had more and more time to, to, uh, to discuss, but we don't. So we're just going to say, look, there's this experiment done by this guy named Engelman. And he took these bacteria that love, that love, love, love. He's, this guy did this experiment. That, that, so they took these bacteria that love oxygen. And he had this, uh, this filament that had algae in it. And what do algae do? What's algae? What are the one things that algae does? They're in water, that's right. And what do they what do they make? What are algae? Algae. What color is algae? Green. 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 So what is it doing? They have chloroplasts, they make food, they're 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 uh, they're autotropes. They do by what? Photosynthesis, right? So they're producing what? If you know that they do photosynthesis, what do they make? Sugar and oxygen. And so he put in water. Then they make oxygen in water. It has to be oxygen in water because there's animals in water. What do animals breathe? Oxygen. There has to be oxygen. We already talked about this. No. no. Okay. So we're moving on. So here's these algae in this green in this tube full of water, and here's these bacteria that love oxygen. When he found the bacteria, where did he find them? Over here. And over here, where did he not find them? Well, not a lot of them, anyways. Why? 
Because it is there's light, no light's being absorbed, and there's no photosynthesis going on over here, not a lot of it anyways. Why is there more photosynthesis over here in the red and the, and the blue, dark blues? Because that's what's Because that's the colors that these pigments absorb, and that's where they can do the most photosynthesis. They can't really do photosynthesis without these colors being present. So there's no oxygen being produced, not a lot of it here, but there's plenty of oxygen over here, and the bacteria go right for it. So that's a really fantastic experiment. I wish I had more time to discuss with you, but we don't have that time, so we're moving on. So let's take a look at this oak leaf. In the summer, as you all know, oak leaves are green. They look like this. But in the winter, or in the fall, the, plant, the plants start to change color. I wish they would have used a maple leaf because you can see the colors a lot more intensely. And then they said the fall, how the, how the fall, they said somewhere when the fall comes, Right, that's what we're talking about. This is they, so they start turning orange and red. So let's think about it. When what's happening in the fall? It gets colder. Okay. There's not much. There's not much sunlight. It's getting closer. Okay, so the sun's actually getting closer, but there's less direct sunlight. So there's less sunlight. It's really the amount of sunlight, not the cold, that makes the trees go dormant. So there's, there's not enough sunlight, so the trees start to go to sleep. So what are they going to do with those leaves? Are those leaves going to be useful to them during the winter? No. No, no so they just get rid of them. So they start to, they start, leaves start to die. And the first pigment to go is chlorophyll. So as you start, so the chlorophylls go. Now you know, based on uh, the diagram, that chlorophyll is good at absorbing what? First one goes in the other. So you have, you have chlorophyll A, B, and then the carotenoids. Well, the, the A is really good at absorbing the red, a lot of the red, right? Yes. And then B was good, I think, it, I can't remember right now, at the blue. Absorbing the blue. And I think it does a little bit. And the carotenoids are really good at the orange. Uh, at, at orange. At the blue. It was it stopped in the green. They stopped at the green, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I don't remember, so I'm just going to go ahead. So there's, there's B and there's A. Let's just say that. So what happens if this A, what happens if this A here, this chlorophyll, dies first? or doesn't die. The plant, the plant is dying, but the chlorophyll starts to break down first. So it's not working, right? So this pigment goes away. This goes away. So what happens? So what, what color are you going to see? You're going to see red. Oh, and what color are the maple leaves in, in, in the fall? So now you see red because now the leaves start changing color because where you used to not see red because the chlorophyll absorbed it, now you see a big old red leaf. And the reason it's red and orange, right, and yellow, is because these pigments that absorb in this range of the frequency of light, they start to break apart. They, have you ever seen a blue leaf? Oh my God. I mean, I'm asking. I and they could. They have I don't know. Flowers, I've never seen one. They have blue flowers. Flowers are different. Okay. All right, but let's not jump around. You see, it's jumping around. It gets us confused. So it's a really great question. Go. Could we have blue leaves? I mean, you could, I guess, but I don't know. I don't think so because I've never seen one. So I would guess as you go right from. Probably just rare. What, well, I think what happens is you go right from this this red and orange and yellow and then the leaf turns black because the bacteria and the fungi are eating it and it's just all gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you never get ever get to blue. I don't know why. I don't know why we don't have blue leaves and why there are no plants. Like, how long would it take before the fun, the... I mean we could try to do some thinking and try to look at some, I, I don't really want to spend too much time doing this okay but we could we could sit down and look at it and do some research and really look at the different colors of light and see what if we got rid of this pigment, we got rid of that pigment, what colors we get. But let's not even go into that, that let's not go into it in that depth. The whole point is that the reason that the, that the leaves change color is that we lose one pigment first and then everything goes away and it turns brown and black. Yeah, yeah, the leaves are dying. The leaves are dying. The trees are still alive, but the leaves are dying, right? The, leaf, the trees go dormant. They use the sugar that they put away to eat over the winter. They're alive, they're just, and they're, eat, they're doing everything very slowly. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. So, again, when we look at, uh, at, at photosynthesis, we can look at 
four separate uh, parts that you need to know. You're going to need to know this for the test. So this is really kind of key. The first step, don't worry about the text. Just make sure you write down the four steps because this is the four steps you need to know. And also, once you learn these four steps, you're going to, at least two of them, two of them, you're going to, two of these, you're going to, two of these, you're going to need for respiration, for cellular respiration. So let's take a look at it, what they are. The first is the primary, uh, primary photo event. That's when that light first hits the pigments, the first set of pigments. Then you have charge separation. Then you have electron transport. And then you have chemosmosis. And this is where you make your ATP. This is where most of your ATP is made here. You make some ATP up here, but this is your big one. You have chemosmosis in, in your cells as well, but you don't have the first part. You don't do that first part. These are the four steps to making it, making ATP, making sugar. These are the four, uh, four steps to making ATP. Are we clear? Okay. So the photon of light is captured by the pigment. The result is a primary photo event, the excitation of the electron with a pigment, right? We talked about how the light is going to excite the electron. You may not understand it completely, but you know it happens now, right? That photoelectric event. Then there's a charge separation. Uh, the excitation energy is transferred to a specialized chlorophyll pigment termed the reaction center, which reacts by transferring the energy, le energetic electron to an acceptor molecule, thus uh, initiating electron transport. So what is that doing? It's taking the high energy electron like a game of hot potato. So to translate what I just read, I give you a hot a potato. A hot potato is, has a lot of what? Energy. has a lot of energy. So if I take a potato that's really hot and I hand it to you, Charlie, it's burning hot. And I tell you, if you drop it, you lose your whole, you fail the class. So you can't, it can't touch the floor. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to set it down. You can't touch the floor. You can keep tossing it up. Yeah, keep tossing it up. Okay, that's one way. Can I, have you never played yeah, I might it? Blow it. Yeah, you pass it. Have you never played a game of hot potato? Yes, I have. Okay, so you have not, but mo a lot, most of us. Did you just say put the potato in your shirt? Like, hold it, hold it, hold it in your shirt. Like, hold it in your shirt, like how you put it. I know what you're talking about. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, God bless you, God bless you, thank you, you get the point, stay with the conversation, you guys do this on purpose, I swear, so in a game of hot potato, for those of you that have never played the game of hot potato, is that you're given a potato, oh, it could be a ball, we just call it a potato, and you're supposed to pass it to the next person, because you're about to get another potato, and you just keep passing these potatoes around the room, and the first one to drop it loses. Mm -hmm. And no, you're not allowed to set it down. Right. All right, that's not part of the game. <laughs> or put it in your shirt or whatever other ideas you have. So anyways, the, 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 the system uses the same process. It takes the energy, gets excites the electron, then it passes the electron over, and there's their time and so on. All right, so it, you know what I'm at, we're going to do? Listen carefully. Tuesday's test, I still want you to do cellular respiration. I do want you to do all the homework. Are we clear? The entire chapter 8 has to be done. But we'll make Tuesday's test just about photosynthesis. Oh, yeah. and, then, and then we'll make uh, the test after Thanksgiving break on cellular respiration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, go on now. Can we... Let me record this. So I'm going to simplify this stuff, and so you have to, you have to, you know, even if even more probably even simpler than what the book tells you. So if the key is that you have light coming in. Let me, let me change this color. Hmm. Okay, so you have light coming in, and remember it's a wave and a particle. So what do we call that wave and particle? What do we call light? Yeah, it is energy. That's right. But what 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 do we call the the wave the thing that is a wave and a particle? Uh, photon. I mean, photon. Photon. Not proton. Don't get it confused. Photon with an with an F. I mean with a pH, but an F sound. 
So you have photosystem, photo system two is first. That doesn't make sense, Miss Mendoza. Oh. Yes, I know, Johnny. I know it doesn't make sense. Uh, but it's the way it is. We call it photosystem two. That's it. It's probably because photosystem one was the first one described, and then they discovered photosystem two, and then later they discovered photosystem two was first. But whatever the reason is, photosystem two is first. Huh? Why didn't they change the name? I know. I know. I'm just saying they didn't, and we're not going to worry about it. So photosystem two, light comes in and hits it. This is what it looks like. Here's the light, the photon coming in. The electron gets transported, blah, 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 like a, like a, you know, like a ping pong, or not ping pong, but you ever see a, 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 a pinball, pinball, you ever see a pinball machine that bounces all around? Well, that's what's happening with the energy. It's bouncing all around. Huh? Oh, it hits the pigments, the chlorophyll molecules. The chlorophyll, that's the whole point of chlorophyll, right, is to absorb the light. And so that's what's happening. It's absorbing the light. The electrons get excited, right? Because remember that Einstein discovered that photoelectric effect. The, the, pho the electrons get excited. They're jumping around. They're moving from one molecule to the next. They're all over the place here. And it goes over to what we call electron donor. And, and then it goes to the electron acceptor, right? So this is the, this is the kind of reactive center. This was going to give up the electron. All the energy got transferred to it. It's going to give up that electron, but then this one's going to accept it. What's the electron acceptor? So it's like a brain. Huh? With signals like a brain. It kind of, in a way, in the sense that it's it's transferring electrical signals. Yes, but it's not really a signal because there's not a lot of information there, except maybe that there's light or there isn't. It's transferring energy, right? But it does look a little like that neuron in that brain, right? Where you where you see little things firing. So it gets traced around the, the electron, the electron, high energy electron, high energy. Goes to the e electron acceptor, and the electron acceptor is exactly that. It's a it's a molecule that does what? Accept. Accepts the electron. I mean that's just that simple. So see the donor has the electron here. The, the molecule, the, uh, the electron gets excited by the light, right? And then the electron gets what? Accepted. It gets accepted. It gets transferred. Do you see the electron transferring? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Because you should see it in order to really understand it. Some of you aren't looking, so you can't possibly be seeing it. So the electron transfers over. Then, of course, what happens to the electron over here to the what we call the electron donor? What do you think is going to happen here to this electron? It's going to come to this one. It's going to be low energy, but in the chlorophyll. But then what happens when light hits it? It's going to jump up. Do you see what happens? So it starts, actually starts, the, the electron starts down here in chlorophyll. This is chlorophyll. It started down here, but when light hits it, what happens to it? It pops up. High energy, vibrating, think of a little, you know, you play video games, think of one of those video game things where it's all glowy and jumpy. And there it is, it's glowing and jumping, it's ready to, and you have an electron acceptor, what's it going to do? Accepted. It's going to accept that high energy electron. And we call that, when it does it, we call that reduced because the charge just went negative. This went negative, so you reduced the charge, but you don't have to worry about that, I'm not going to worry about that. So it gets transferred, and then that electron goes, and then of course the next electron gets transferred over, and then it goes up when another photon hits it over and over and over again. And it happens all day long, literally during the day as the sun shines, that's happening inside the plant. So that's, the, that's kind of the, the chemistry of that, the energy, the energy transfer, the physics of it. Why does it do it, right? Great question. Why does it, why does it have to do that? Why does it have to... Uh, we're not going to worry about sulfur bacteria, so... But why does it have to do that? What is the purpose of it, right? The purpose of it is to get energy to the Calvin cycle. So the whole purpose of all this complicated stuff, you know, the granum, the stacks of thalicoids, right? and all the light reactions that are happening here, which is what we're talking about right now, right? All these light reactions, 
the whole purpose is to get energy to the Calvin cycle. Because what's the Calvin cycle doing? It's making sugar. Good. That's exactly right. It's going to make sugar. You did. But do it again. Because you keep drawing it. So you keep it in. This is what... Remember, this stuff's not happening. This is all happening in the thalicoids up here. The light reactions are all happening in thalicoids. But what are called the light independent reactions, dark reactions, or the Calvin cycle, are all happening in that, in that space. In the what? What's that space called? No, the thalicoid is in the light reaction. Stroma. Good, I heard it. Yes, good. It's the stroma. Stroma. With an R. Not stoma. The stoma is the opening in the leaf, right? So there's kind of those scale problems. Remember, when you're talking about water leaving the leaves, you're talking about big scale, the plant scale. This is even smaller than the cell. This is an organelle, right? Here, water is being used to break up and produce oxygen. Let's look at where that is. This is a complicated drawing, but it's really, really good. So I'm going to use it. Okay? So bear with the complication. Do you need to know all the details? No. no. I need you to understand the idea, and so you can answer this gentleman's question. Right? Again, remembering that we don't say names, right? We, I want I, to answer his question, you need to understand this process. So let's take a look at it. I'm going to point out, and I'm going to put a little asterisk by the things you need to know. All right, you don't need to know the shape. And actually, you're going to need to know quite a bit from here, but you're not going to need to know all the details. All right, all right so first one was which one? Photosystem, Photosystem 2. Notice that Photosystem 1 comes after it. I know it's weird. Deal with it. So Photosystem 1 comes after it, right? So light comes in, elect, energy of electrons goes up, right? As you go from, on this, this is a graph, this is a Y axis, right? The higher you up in this diagram, what, um, the what? The higher the energy, good. We gotta remember, we gotta look at these diagrams. When you get diagrams on these tests, when you get diagrams on my tests, when you get diagrams in the ACT, pay attention in the book reading. When you're reading books and you're looking, at you, they give you a diagram figure out what they want you to know. So the higher up the electron is, the more energy it has. So here's this photon. Obviously, these have low energy. The photon comes in, boom, 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 boom. It hits the P60, which is that donor molecule, right, sitting there. And then what happens to water? It goes in. Water goes in. What, what gets taken out? What gets taken away from water? Oxygen. Well, the electron. Do you see it? See, water has extra the, the The system, because of this extra energy, rips the electrons off, high energy electrons off. And of course, without the electrons, you got hydrogen atoms sitting there. Without electrons, you see the pluses? Yeah. All right, so these now don't have electrons. Well, the poor oxygen, what's it going to do? It lost, its, it, lost the, it lost the hydrogens. What are they going to do to each other? Two of them. Two of them are going to do what? Right, so those, when those, when there, when there's, for every two molecules of water, you're going to get one oxygen molecule. But that's why we have half. Do you see the half there? Because yeah. for every one, oxygen, one, one water molecule, you only get half an oxygen, half an O2. So oxygen needs that second bond. What's it going to do to it? It needs two bonds because it lost two bonds, right? It lost the two hydrogens. Uh, it, they match up with each other, and they go away. Goodbye, bye. And that either goes to cellular respiration or it goes where? This goes, we're in the chloroplast, right? This is happening here in the thalicoids of, of the chloroplast. You're making oxygen. You don't need the oxygen here in this space. It's going it's to leave the, the thalicoids. It's going to leave the chloroplast. It's either going to go into the mitochondria where cellular respiration will use it, or it's going to go, right before it can get to the air, where does it have to go? Out of the cell. Out of the, out of the cell, yes, and then it can diffuse, right, because it's, it's a gas. It's going to go out of the cell, then it goes where? So it's in the leaf, outside the cell, where's it going to go? Oh, outside. Right, but how does it get outside? 
stoma, through the stoma. Do you see that? So the oxygen leaves here, goes out. I'm just trying to help you understand scale, right? You have to remember this is all happening in the chloroplast. The oxygen has to leave the, the thylakoid, leave the chloroplast, leave the cell, then leave the leaf. Then it can go out into the air, right? I think you should know that, don't you? I mean, it's, it, I think you know that. But you have to think it. You have to think it through. You should write it down several times. What would I do if I were you? Here's what I would do if I were you. I would sit there and I would go, you know what? Oxygen is made as a byproduct of... That means it's not, it's not, it's produced, but it's not really the main purpose of the, of the reaction, right? It's a good question. Of uh, the light reactions then it goes into one of two places. It's either going to be the mitochondria. See, this is what I would do at home if I were you. Mitochondria where it goes, cellular respiration. Where it's used, right, for cellular respiration. Or, there's an or here, it goes out of cell. Then it goes out of the cell. Uh, out of the stoma, right? So then you have, it goes out of the cell, then out of the cell, out the leaf, out the stoma, out of the leaf, through the stoma, into the air. And if it's an underwater plant, what are you going to see? Yeah, bubbles. bubbles. You're see bubbles. And if it's, what is, what are, the, what are those bubbles? Oxygen, right? And if you were underwater, you would make bubbles, right? Yeah. What would your bubbles may be mostly? Uh, carbon dioxide. Because that's what you breathe out. This, you're an animal. And plants breathe out oxygen. And plants breathe out oxygen. See, that's the difference. Good. Good. We actually breathe out both. Um, but we breathe out more carbon dioxide than we do oxygen. We take up as much oxygen as we can, but we're not perfect. All right? All right, so... So all that's going to happen. That's what's hap that was the journey of this tiny little, so I would say you need to know the journey, the journey of... <laughs> Be quiet. So the journey of the oxygen. All right, know the journey of that oxygen molecule. Know where does it go. Why is it not used? Know the equation. Uh, no, you don't need, to. I, I, you'll see it again. If you want to spend some time learning it, you can. It might be helpful. But honestly, I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to give you like H2O turns into what? Do you need to know that water turns into oxygen? Yes. Do you need to know 2H plus plus one half O2 yields, or water yields this? No. no. Not for this class. I'm not really concerned about that. This equation, though, is chock full of information, right? It tells you that you need two water molecules, right? So you can get one oxygen molecule. It tells you that. You should know that. If you don't remember the equation, you should still know that you need two waters to make one oxygen molecule. You should know where the oxygen goes, and you'll see where the hydrogen is being used. You'll see where this goes. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit. So we're going to use the hydrogen again. It's not, it's not wasted. But the oxygen is used by the plant. I need you to really, really, that's like one of the key points here, because they love to test that, because there's so many people that don't understand that, that it's really disturbing. Oxygen, plants do use oxygen in the mitochondria, because they do cellular respiration. They do. They use it, but they don't use it here in the chloroplast. In the chloroplast. They don't use the oxygen in the chloroplast. Is that clear? Yes? No? Maybe? Okay. All right, so there's this enzyme here that splits the water, by the way. There's this, there's this enzyme that splits the water. You ask, how does you split water? 
Well, one of the labs I want to do, and I was hoping to do it Tuesday after the test, get a test for photosynthesis is going to be relatively short because we're breaking up these big tests into little tests, right? So what I was hoping is we could quickly split water. How would you like to do that? Yeah, we can split it just like we can do it just like the plant does. It, water, you can take water apart. We can take it apart. And extra yeah, exactly. And where would we get energy? We can't use the sun, not really, because if we use the sun without the enzyme, if we use the sun, all we do is boil the water. And boiling water, steam is still H two O, so that wouldn't help. What what do we what did that what did this enzyme use? Electrons. Where what kinds of electrons? Where can we get electrons as humans? Lightning, yeah, but I'm not playing with lightning. She <laughs> said A what? She said what? No, Electrons. Where are we going to get electrons? If we the sun, we could, it doesn't have to give you electrons, it gives you energy, it gives you photons. What are we going to do with electrons? Where are we going to get it? Yeah. Does rain, does lightning split the water? It could. I bet you, yes, actually, it does. There's ozone created in the atmosphere all the time. But usually it's, it's combining oxygen, uh, oxygen molecules, not splitting the water. So there's all kinds of things that happen when lightning, when lightning strikes, because lightning is full of energy. But you want to know how we do it? It's kind of cool. You, I can't believe no one said it. And don't tell the other classes, because I'm going to ask them the same question. Are you ready? Because... Guess, get, get, take another second because we don't have a lot of time. Right. Static is a good idea, but that would be, it's kind of unpredictable. Wire, I mean, not like... We could plug it into the wall, but that would hurt. That would be scary, right? I mean, we could. We could stick the, we could take a wire with two wires, one in positive and one negative, and kind of just stick it on the... I wouldn't like doing that. Say, somebody said it, said it. A battery. So I'm going to I'm going to buy, I'm going to go buy... Five nine volt batteries, so we got five groups. Maybe uh, if I can convince my wife to let me buy more, I will. But they're expensive. Hey, she does. We I spent thousands of dollars in classroom, and I'm like, my wife is like, we don't, we're not rich. I'm like the kids say I am, and so anyways, so we take those nine volt batteries, and we can and we can put a little salt water, or look, they put them in salt water, salt because water is actually an insulator. I mentioned that earlier in the year. But salt water is a good conductor. And then we can put a little test tube over the positive end and a little test tube over the negative end. Mm -hmm. Now, what that's going to do, I, I'm going to quickly show you this because this is what's happening. And it's, a, it's really a useful thing to do because what happens is, you know, you have a positive and negative, right? Positive and negative. What, the reason it works, the reason why it's worth talking about right now is because... It shows you what the plant does all the time with 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 uh, enzymes. So we'll take these tiny test tubes, and you're going to use your hand because it's not going to hurt. It won't shock you. Two tiny test tubes. You're going to kind of stick them over the ends, and the electricity is going to go from from positive to negative. See, right? And so you get that when that electricity flows in the salt water, the water's going to break, just like the break happens here. In using this enzyme, right? Using light. Now, when that happens, you're going to form bubbles in the positive side, and that's going to fill up the top. It's actually there's going to be a gas here, gas one. And then there's going to be bubbles on the negative side, too. And that's going to be, and it's actually, and what's interesting, what's really kind of cool, and it works every year, every time I do it, it works. So I probably just jinx myself, but. Uh, it, I'm so happy every time it works because, it, you know, sometimes things don't work in science. That's the point, right? We have to figure out why. And then over here we form twice as much, two times, two times the gas. Two times the gas on the negative pole. So oxygen, it turns out oxygen, oh... When, when we take off that hydrogen, it has a negative charge. It turns out the hydrogen has a positive charge. So where's the hydrogen ion going to go? To the what? Positive. So the positive is going to go to the positive, positive, attract positive. Oh, no. It goes to the negative, right. Again, you guys say things without thinking sometimes. All right, so negative, this negative is going to go where? 
to the positive. Now, when the two oxygens meet, what are they going to form? O2, good. Oxygen gas. When the two hydrogens meet, what are they going to form? H2. Where are the electrons coming from? The, elect the electricity. So you form hydrogen gas. So how much... Let me ask you, if, you be, if you're going to guess which one's which, how much gas do you think, how much hydrogen gas are you going to make versus ma the oxygen gas? I think the same. More hydrogen gas than oxygen gas? Yes. Why? Because there's two. Exactly. In fact, you would expect there to be twice as much hydrogen gas than oxygen gas, yeah. specifically. And that's what happens every time we do it. We form twice as much hydrogen gas than we do oxygen gas. And it's really cool to see because you see it. And so it's really, it's really fast. It's a little expensive for me, but I think it's fast, and we can do it in a period, half a period, right after your test. That's my plan anyways. I think it's a really cool little lab. And Mr. Krishna showed that to me. We're using a 9-volt battery. Did they? Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not doing well. I want you to make the gas. I want, and then if we're careful, if we're careful, we can make water. You want to make water? If you're careful, what we can do is we can take a test tube and we can carefully remove it. Now, the reason I'm saying careful is you have to use your thumb. You have to put your thumb right over that, pop, that, that cap. If you don't, the gas is going to go away and it's not going to work. Then we're going to take this little, this little matchstick, this little, little burning piece of wood. Not burning, it's just, it just needs to be a little, it needs to be glowy. Oh, my teacher did that. No, it's just a long stick. And you take it, it's not a match, it's a long stick. And we just make sure it's glowy. And you stick it in, and what will happen is if you're careful, actually if, you, if it's on fire especially, you, if you get enough of the gas, and you put it in there, it's going to go, pop! Yeah. And you're going to make water. <laughs> Dude, I can show you a video that I made last year when we did this. Because we did this... I can show you later. We did this last year. I made this little, I mean, I did all kinds of stuff, all kinds of fancy special effects. I put little hydrogen atoms floating around in the air in front of the kids. I did all kinds of silly things in the video. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you if you watch it at home. And what you see in the video, uh, I don't want to say your name, is me jumping every time it happens. I can't. I can't. Mendoza. Yeah. No, we don't have time. I'm sorry. All right. You don't have to watch it. I'm just saying it's not it's not important. But that's what I'm trying to hope, trying to do for Tuesday. Okay. So I mean, if you want to, if you don't, you don't have to. It's not it's not really going to make or break it. All right. So the electrons get are excited. You grab the electrons. You excite them with this energy on the p60. Then they go up. There's the this is the, they're excited. They're at the reaction center, and then it goes over to what we call electron carrier. Now this is you. Uh, this is quinone, all right, plastoquinone. But you don't have to know that. Do you have to know that? No. No, you don't have to know that. So just call it Q. But it's an elect. It's an electron carrier. It's going to carry it somewhere. It's going to go and take it to a complex. You don't have to know the complex. No. But what's going to happen at the complex? This is the complex here. This is the complex. What you do have to know, not the name, but that that electron is going to do what to the hydrogen? What's that electron going to do to the hydrogen? Attract or repel? So, attract. Why do you say attract? Because it's positive. So you got a membrane, right? There's a membrane, phospholipid membrane. Let me draw it straight up. So you have a membrane. You have a complex in the middle. It's a bunch of different proteins, but we call it complex. And you have this hydrogen now ions sitting there, a bunch of them, there's actually a lot, Hi. and so what happens is that not there's more over here, many, 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 many more, so this is high, and the other side's low, but there's a lot of hydrogen, it's just lower than the other end, right? And then you get this electron, and what's it doing to these, pro these things? They're attracting it. This electron goes through this pipe. What do you think is going to happen to these hydrogens? They're going to follow them, and they're going to go in. And that is called coupling, right? You're coupling that reaction. So the electrons are moving, the electrons are flowing through the, are, are, flow, are being transferred from one protein to the next. The hydrogen ions try to follow them because they're attracted to the electron. 
And as they follow them through, you know, they're like stalkers, right? And they're following the, electro the poor little electron through the complex, and they get trapped on this side. They can't get through. They can't get back. So they get high. They go from what? Low to high. They are, we are using energy, but there's no ATP being used because this is a coupling reaction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Coupling, tra tra uh, uh, I should say it's a, it's a transport mechanism called coupling. Right? We're coupling the transport of the electron with the hydrogen ion. What that means is that unlike active, this is secondary active transport, right? From the test, right? Remember the test? From the book. Look up chapter 7, secondary, tran secondary uh, <laughs> transport, I mean active transport, right? So there's no direct ATP being used, but we are going from low to high. How do we, where are we getting the energy from the electron? Does that make sense? Because where did the electron get its energy? From the sun, right? So the electrons get, the hydrogen ions go from low to high. And that's what's happening here at this complex. And then, of course, now you've still got the electron. This is another electron carrier. And again, you don't need to know the electron carriers. The kind of blue, the blue lightning here is kind of showing you which way to go. And the electron carrier takes it, the electron dumps it off over here. Where what else? Now what happens over here? <coughs> to that, that electron's lost its energy, right? It made it made a high concentration of hydrogen ions on one side of the membrane low. That's what it was for. You asked what it was for. That why are we getting it? Uh, the, what is photosystem to do? The very first thing that photosystem 2 does is it creates a high and low hydrogen ion concentration. That's what it does. <coughs> How? By giving that electron high energy, trans attracting the hydrogens to one side and trapping them. And then, I'll, we will repeat it. I will repeat it a couple more times before the test. I'll send you another video. I have a couple other videos I can give you. But that, I mean, there's, uh, there's just all kinds of stuff. But we're going to trap the hydrogen ions on one side. Then the low energy electrons going to move on to photosystem one. When what happens in photosystem one? The trick is in the 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 answer is in the question. Photosystem. What do you think is happening at the photosystems? Photons. The photons are being used, and then that what's that? That photons going to come in. What's it going to do to that electron? Charge it up again, just like your battery, right? So now it's high energy again. There it is, super high energy. Yeah. Why is it still low? low electrons? All right. So it was. It was the energy was low here, right? What What made it go up? Jump up. The photon. The photon. You can't see it on the screen. So let me do this. It, the, what made this energy? The energy of this electron go up. The photon. Does that make sense? Okay. So that jumped up here. And then it got transported, and we, what do we use it for? What do we use the energy for? To move those hydrogen ions, right? To trap them. To trap the hydrogen ions. That's what we used it for. So we can have what? A high and a low. If we have high and low, then we can use it to make ATP. Because that's potential energy. That's that is potential energy. Well, just like you have a battery, high and low, plus and minus. Does that make sense? Okay. So now you use that energy already. It's used up, just like you use up your cell phone. It's low. Now what do we do? Charge it up with what? Light. The photon comes in. It jumps up. Now it's high energy. Now you got to get what? Another what? To take it to electron. electron carrier. So there's another electron carrier. Do you need to know all these electron carriers? No. You don't need to know all, any, any of the ones I've mentioned this, thus far. But you do need to know the next one. This is an enzyme, but you see here's another enzyme. And this enzyme is going to take NAD plus, plus hydrogen, and make what? NAD NADPH. This is the carrier you need to know. NADPH. You really don't want to know. I thought we learned about that. Yeah, what's the difference between that and We did. Add the okay, so look at it. NADP plus plus a hydrogen positive. Now you have NADPH. What happened here? They added the electron. 
And if you add the electron, now they're not positive anymore. Do you see that? And it's a lot of energy in that electron. But it, now this thing can carry it. Where is it going to carry that? Where is it going to carry it? That energy from the NADPH to the Calvin cycle. That's why this one's so important. In respiration, when you get to that part of the chapter, in cellular respiration, it's NADH. There's no P. If you, uh, you keep asking me what this is, I'm going to tell you. You're not going to be happy about it. You don't need to know it, but you want to know. I'll tell you. It's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. What? <laughs> nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Yeah, right. Do you need to know? I said no. no. You don't need to know. I'm asking you to know. I'm, I know you're all getting upset already. I'm asking you to know NADPH. NA, NADPH. Just know this that this is the elect. See all these electron carriers? You, I mean, could you memorize them? Sure, if you want to, whatever. But know that the electron's being carried, right? That's, that's something you should know about all this. And know that this one here is the carrier that you need to know because this is the carrier that leaves the thylakoid and goes where? Into the Calvin cycle in the, in the stoma. Good. Excellent. I'm glad you guys are getting it. But just because you understand it right now doesn't mean you understand it, right? You've got to go home and go over this and, and write it down and, and quiz each other. Do we get that? Because do not go home. Okay, we're done. Yeah. Uh-huh. Where do the trauma come in there? I can't hear you. Where that come the stroma, that's where the Calvin, where does the stroma come from? It, uh, where does it come into play? That's where the Calvin cycles happen. It's a space filled with fluid, okay, in the chloroplast. All right? So now, like here, let's look at the thylakoid member again. This is another drawing that shows everything all at once. You ready? Here comes a photon. There's an electron. Where do the electrons come from? Water comes into this water splitting enzyme. Rips off the electrons. There's the hydrogen and the oxygen. Obviously, two of them. You need to know the path of that oxygen. This is all photosystem two. You have the high energy electron. Where is it going to go? We call it the some people call it the antenna complex, right? And the electron gets carried by Q, right? Do you need to know Q? No, no. but that's the carrier. It carries it from this protein here, from this chlorophyll, right? These chlorophyll molecules in this in this complex, over to this protein. Where you getting what? What's what's that electron doing? Uh, it's going to the hydrogens and saying what? What's it saying to the hydrogens? Come here. Come here. It's saying come here, honey. And the, the 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 hydrogen being a sucker says sure and just follows along, right? So there goes the hydrogen goes. Hey, I love you. No, bye. Ah, help! I'm stuck. All right, so. That's what happens to the hydrogens. I'm just trying to help you remember. All right, I'm trying to do something for you. That's the that's a coupling, right? So there's no act no ATP being used. Where's the energy coming from? From those electrons, it's drawing them in like magnets, right? Or like Jason Momoa at a teenage concert, right? What the heck is that? Aqua. It's not. He's not. He's he's not white. He's what I mean. Whatever. He's he's Aquaman. I don't know. Who well, look at the commercials. I'm not time. Oh my gosh! Why do you focus on that? Why don't you ask me what's 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 Q stand for? Why don't you say where did the electrons come from? Why do I hear that? I mean, you said it, so what do you expect me to do? Nothing. I just bust your chops. Don't worry about it. All right. Hydrogen ions come in. Electron goes on, and it's over here now to this carrier, right? Now we get to this carrier. Where does it go then? It goes to another, now it's low energy, right? Up here was high energy, but now it's low energy. You need another photon taking that electron. It just keeps getting passed like a game of hot potatoes. Right? Like we talked about yesterday. Exactly, exactly. So it just keeps being passed along. And the electron gets here, you get another, another photon coming and giving it more high energy, gets transferred again. These are all carriers, right? You don't need to know their names. If you study it in college, you'll need to know what they are, but not here. Right? Right? Okay. That's as, 
as you would use your hand, they're using, they're passing it by touching still. The way you would use the, the stove to heat up the potato, they're using the photon to give it energy. All right? So, so the carrier is people. Yeah, carriers are the people. These are all people, all the way down the line. Yeah? So when the photon like, hits the thing, is that, like, if you're, is that as soon as you're passing it? Yeah, it's the electrons just sitting there waiting. So it's not like it's flowing, right? I mean, I, honestly, it's a good question. I don't know. But I imagine it's sitting there, and when the photon hits it, and jumps. Does that make sense? That's what I imagine. So the electrons are going in here, and then finally gets to the, the final electron acceptor. That's going to be how I'm going to phrase it on the test, if you're paying attention. The final electron acceptor, NADPH, in the light reactions, in the light reactions, is NADPH. And that's what's going to take what? Take it to the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycles in the stoma. Stoma. So that's really important. Because that will be on a test. NADPH. What else will be on a test? How many, uh, where's oxygen made? Photosystem 2. In the light reactions. Uh, another thing will be on, why do you need water? So you, so for a photosystem 2. To get the electrons. You need water to get the electrons. You see, it's all here. You need water so you can get the electrons. The oxygen is extra, it gets kicked out. But it will be used, maybe in the mitochondria, maybe it'll get kicked out of, this, of the plant, whatever. The hydrogen, why is it being passed around in the comp, uh, uh, down the chain? So you can get the hydrogen ions. What do you want on this side? You want them high. Because what's going to happen with the gradient? You get high over here, what's over here? Low. High hydrogen ions over here, low over here, that's going to let it flow. Why do we want to make it flow? Because when you make it flow, I hope that's the next slide, I can't remember. So here we have, uh, let's take a look at it. What do you see here? Somebody interpret the diagram for me. What do you see? Tell me what you see. The light going in, I, see, I hear that, that's correct. The enzyme breaking up water, I see that as well. The electron coming up, we know that this arrow means electron. We know that's a stroma. We know this is a thylakoid space. We got that. So electrons are getting transferred. Good. What do you say? Wait, what do you say? what's the next step after electrons? As electrons get transferred, what happens? Hydrogen goes from low to high. So let's write that down because it's not written, right? That's not something we see. That's something we're saying. So let's write. Let's low hydrogen ions to high. Where do you get the energy? from the sun or the high energy electron, right? The electron is the source of the energy. But where'd that electron get the energy? From the sun, so you're correct. So that, so far we haven't made any, any ATP. That was all just photosystem two and the BF, a B6-F complex, right? That's all, that's the only thing we're dealing with there is just making that going, that all, all photosystem two did was produce oxygen and get a high energy electron. And in combination with this complex, it got the, the hydrogen ions to go from low to high. That's it. Do you see photosystem one drawn here at all? No, because what are we focusing on in this step? Photosystem two, yes, but why? Because what is the purpose of getting all these hydrogen ions on this side in the thylakoid space. What is the purpose of that? To make the gradient that allows us to make ATP, correct. So to make the gradient that allows us to make ATP. That's correct. So here's high, here's low, right? Here's high, hydrogen ions, here's low. Didn't we say that? So now we have the opening. See, you can't go back this way. This, this, that complex won't allow the ions to go from in this direction only allows them to go in this direction. This protein will allow them to go through this direction. Has anybody here ever seen a water wheel? Yes. Yes. Right? So high water, like in a waterfall. You have a waterfall, it falls, and what does it do to the water wheel? It turns the wheel. We can turn on the, the water wheel here in the uh, fish tank, and you can look at it. The water up high falls and turns the wheel. We can watch that all day. So as long as you have high and you have low, the these hydrogen ions will go from high to low, 
And what will happen is this protein will turn. And every time the protein turns, what you do is you create one ATP a a molecule. You have ADP plus, and they don't draw it, but inorganic phosphate turns with the energy from the hydrogen ions moving from high to low, right? Turns this into ATP. That's how you make ATP. This is called, we've, taught, we've already labeled it, you should already know this, but I'll go ahead and draw it for you, or write it for you. This is called co-transport, isn't it? This is called co-transport. Hold on one second, I'll answer your question. Co-transport, or indirect active transport, right? Or secondary, if you want to call it secondary. Let's call it secondary. Why is it secondary active transport? Because it's moving from high to low, right? But it's still like facilitated. Right. It's still, it's still, you get the energy, you get the concentration gradient from, from this part, which needs energy. And why doesn't this, why don't all of these hydrogen ions go back to equilibrium if they can go through here? Why don't we stop making ATP? Because you're constantly doing what? Bringing it low to high. But that's only as long as you have what? Light. Without light, you can't pull these back. So very, very quickly, you start running out of, of high to low, which means you start running out of ATP. Does that make sense? So this is how you make the ATP from the light reactions. There it is, right in front of you. This is called chemiosmosis. This is called chemiosmosis. I know it says, I know it says osmosis. I know, but it's not water. Chemiosmosis. That's right. There's the process of making, and let's just consider it the process of making ATP through the movement of hydrogen ions through a concentration gradient. I already said it all, and, how, and what is it? Right here. There it is. Using the concentration gradient to make ATP. That's it. The movement of chemicals, in this case hydrogen ions, across the, the protein is chemiosmosis. Do we understand that? Yep. Just that simple. Let's look at it real closely. The chemios, and here's, here it is, defined for you in writing. Chemiosmosis in a chloroplast, complex embedded in thylakoid space, pumps protons to the interior thylakoid, ATP produced the outside surface of the protein, the stromocyte, the protons diffuse back out to the thylakoid space through ATP synthase channels. By the way, that's what this is called. That's what this channel is. This channel here is called ATP synthase. It's actually an enzyme. It's called ATP synthase. What does that mean? What does it do? It makes ATP, synthesizes ATP. Yeah, I heard somebody, I heard a couple people say it, yeah. So it's good. Not that hard, right? And it says it right there, by the way. It, sh it shows you right here, ATP synthase. Yeah. Um, like, I've got some I'll show you. I'm going to send you over the break a video on how this happens. There's a really neat, you can look it up on YouTube as well. You can, we don't have time in class to show it to you, but I'll send it to you guys at home. Yeah, you can see it. It's, uh, we don't have, I don't know if we actually, I don't think we have the actual movie of it, but we have some uh, computer generated models where you can see how we know it works, okay? Or we think it works. Is everybody good with this so far? So far we made the ATP. What do we need to do with that electron though? We have, what do we have to do next with the electron? Make it go from this low energy state. The electron's low right now. It's low because it used up all its energy was used to pull these away. And every time you transfer it, it loses a little bit of energy. So now it's at low, it's low energy state. We need to make it go up again. So what do we need? Another light, another light photon, another photon. So where do we get, where, how do we use that light? Where are we going to get that light? Photosystem one, correct. You just spilled water. Why do you keep doing it? No, it was like this. And I saw water spill. I'm not going to go into it. I can't. So in the Calvin cycle, there's two parts. 
There's energy and there's reducing power. The energy comes from what form? From the light reactions. How do the light reactions send the energy to the Calvin cycle? ATP. That's the energy form. Where does it get the high energy electron to reduce things? NADPH, because that's the carrier. That's it. That's all you need to know. The ATP, these are the two steps that you get from the light reactions that you need to go into the Calvin cycle. What's the job of the Calvin cycle? Glucose. To make glucose. What, at, what atom or element do you need to make glucose? <laughs> See, carbon. You need carbon. Where do we get carbon? It's from the air. CO2 comes from the air into the... Let me redraw that. From the air into the, sto the stoma, no R, into the tissues of the plant. That's right. Into the cell. That's perfect, the mouth. It kind of, it, they look like mouths, but they're actually just little holes with guard cells on it, but that's right. The cell, into the cell, then into what? Into the chloroplast. And there in the chloroplast is where in the space, in the stroma of the chloroplast is where the Calvin cycle grabs the CO2 and puts it into sugar. What does that two word say right there? Tissue, tissue, plant tissue. Right, so that's kind of the pathway. Now, this is some. I would. Some people might argue against it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. This is the most important enzyme on the entire planet. This enzyme, this enzyme changed the face of the earth. This enzyme, this enzyme changed this planet from purple to blue. Rubisco. This enzyme, this enzyme, oh, you want to know its real name, though? Okay, I'll tell you the real name. I'll tell you. It's long, but it's not five pages. It's ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. I like Rubisco. Let's just stick with Rubisco, okay? So Rubisco is literally the most important enzyme you've never heard of. It's the enzyme that, take, that takes carbon dioxide out of the air and allows for sugar to be made. Without Rubisco, you don't make sugar to eat. Bless you. There's no oxygen in our atmosphere, at least not as much as there is now. Right now, the second most concentrated gas in our atmosphere is oxygen. It's, it's nitrogen, then it's oxygen, and then it's carbon dioxide. Before Rubisco, it was nitrogen, then carbon dioxide, then oxygen. Very little oxygen in the atmosphere. Because of Rubisco, carbon dioxide and water got changed into sugar and oxygen. And over a billion years, the, uh, the atmosphere changed. And because the atmosphere changed and the color of the plants changed, what you get is blue skies instead of purple ones. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you. We're not going to get into it. I'm going to show you a documentary. I'll show you the evidence. I'll show you the documentary. We don't make it. It, was, it evolved billions of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the different. That's, that's completely different. See me after school. I'll, I know you thought, but I'm just telling you, it's completely different. See me after school if you want to explain it. We're, we're, gonna, we're having side conversations. We got, we got, it's 2.52. The exam is tomorrow. I'm reviewing for the exam. We're staying focused. Okay. Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that pulls the carbon dioxide. How do you get this molecule that's in air, gas form, out of gas form and put it into something that you call sugar, that you can eat? There it is. That's the, that's the enzyme. All right. There's the magic wand. Let's go on. So here is something that you have. You have this diagram in one of your assignments. If you finished all your assignments, you did this already. 
And I'm sure some people did, but I can see from your faces that a lot of you haven't done your homework. And so this is brand new to you. I'm so sorry for you. If you would have done your homework, this would have been a lot easier for you. So this is a chloroplast. This is the mitochondria. A plant cell has both. A plant cell has both. So in here are your photosystems in the thylakoid membranes. And this is the Calvin cycle in the, in the stroma. As you can see, ATP leaves the photosystems, so the, the light reactions, and so does NADPH, and they go into the Calvin cycle. No problem. We, did, we just discussed that, right? We know how ATP is made through chemiosmosis. We know that NADPH is carrying the high energy electron, and they're both going to the Calvin cycle. They're going to deposit all that energy and all those electrons into glucose. That should be fairly straightforward. There's four things, there's actually five things, the high energy electron and the hydrogen ions, the phosphate, the, NA, the AT, ADP, the NADP plus, all that goes into the photosystem two, photosystem one, along with sunlight to allow for ATP and NADPH to be formed. So think about it, go over the steps because your questions are gonna come from that kind of question. So here you have it, these two are going in and you're making the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is doing what? Making what? Glucose. Glucose. Every, every two turns it actually makes two, three carbon sugars uh, that together can form one glucose. Because how many carbons in glucose? Uh, uh, six. six, excellent. So two, three carbons makes a six. So those of you that have read the chapter, you know that this is what? By the way, what space is this? Where is this? No, stroma is in here. Where is this out here? Cytoplasm. This is the inside the cell. This is an organelle, chloroplast. This is a mitochondria. Look how, how easily I tripped you up. you got to know. You have to get oriented. What am I looking at? What is this picture? This is so important when you're talking about testing to be able to say, okay, this is a picture of what? What am I looking at? Where is this? So in your mind, you should have said, this is in a cell. So this must be the cytoplasm. This is an organelle called the chloroplast. This is another organelle called the mitochondria. You should be thinking like that. You should be orienting your mind. So this is the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, the first step of cellular respiration happens. You'll please notice that all the steps of photosynthesis happen inside the chloroplast. Wait. So those, I want to figure out the steps to, uh, to Photos, these are just the steps up. What these five things, one, two, three, four, and five, are what are needed in the photosystem, the light reactions. Am I clear? Let me pause this because I don't want to embarrass anyone. So we have this, we have this in this cytoplasm, we have the first step of cellular respiration. It turns out that all the steps of photosynthesis happen inside the chloroplast. But cellular respiration, the first step, happens in the cytoplasm. The first step is taking glucose and turning it to pyruvate. It's called glycolysis. No, I'm not spelling it out because by next Monday you should have what? Read the chapter, know the steps of cellular respiration so we can have an intelligent conversation. So the first step of glyco uh, uh, cellular respiration is glycolysis that happens out here in the cytoplasm, then the Krebs cycle, then the electron transport chain. That is cellular respiration right there. Out of cellular respiration comes water. You produce water in cellular respiration. You produce, now hold on. What does cellular respiration need? It needs oxygen. In fact, the electron transport chain needs oxygen. Yeah. There's, that's right. Where is it? Where do you see? Where do you see oxygen being used? You see it used down here. Where do you see it being used? But good. I'm glad that you know that. By the way, that shows that you've read the chapter, right? Because you weren't born with that, were you? You didn't know that knowledge. Did you? Did your mom sit you up with a baby book and read to you the the, the, the steps of glycolysis? No, you didn't. Where'd you learn that information? You read the chapter. That's interesting. <laughs> So, 
Good. I'm not. Made, I'm. I'm trying to point out that you guys can learn if you do your homework on time, right? So, anyways, I, he's right. Glycolysis is anaerobic. You don't need oxygen for glycolysis. You don't need oxygen for the Krebs cycle. Where you need oxygen, the reason you need breathe air at all, the reason you're taking in oxygen, so you can do the electron transport chain. So you can make the biggest amount of ATP, which is here, the electron transport chain, through chemiosmosis, right? Uh, so we, produce, we use chemiosmosis here to produce a lot of ATP. Oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation. Why do we call it oxidative phosphorylation? Because we use oxygen. And what do we do with the oxygen? We use, mix oxygen with hydrogen to make water. Oxygen goes in, water comes out. And in a plant, where does that water, what might, where might that water go? It might go, it might, it might actually evaporate out of the cell, right? Or it might go into what? Into photosynthesis, in the chloroplasts. Yeah. They, they diffuse. They, they have channels for the hydrogen ions. Also, remember, your, your, yeah, they have channels to allow them in. It's a good question. They're ions, so they're not going to diffuse through the membrane, but they, they're small, but they're also very, they're charged, so they're, they need channels, right? We know they don't pass through because you saw in chemiosmosis that we're able to create a, 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 a gradient. If you can create a gradient, that means they don't diffuse through a membrane, right? Like oxygen gas just diffuses through it all, right? All right, so we're good with all this. Where does Rubisco come in? It brings it in. Of course, Rubisco is not out here. I just drew it out here. I should just erase that and just, let me see, just erase it. Because it's, the Rubisco is not out here. The, the CO2 diffuses through the membrane, and what you get is Rubisco is in here. And it captures that CO2 and brings it into the Calvin cycle. So you see, what produced the CO2? So the, the, and what did it CO2 do? It made what? Which was then broken down into what? C, in, this, in pyruvate, and then to, and then back to glucose, and then back to CO2, back and forth in a big cycle. What does pyruvate get broken down by? So we'll read your chapter. We'll talk about that next week, because that's cellular respiration. But the, what I want you to see is the relationship between cellular respiration, which you're learning about, should have, learned, should have read already, but whatever, that you're going to have a test on next week, and your cellular respiration, which is this part, right, and photosynthesis, which is stuff going on here. The relationship is that the oxygen produced in, in photosynthesis is used by respiration. The CO2 produced in cellular respiration is used by photosynthesis. The water produced by cellular respiration is used by photosynthesis. So you see, it, it's perpetual. The amount of matter required is all self-contained. But of course you lose CO2, right? Because you have to open the stoma, right? To let the CO2 in. And as soon as you do that, some CO2, you know, you equilibrate. Movement goes in both directions. So you lose water, you lose some CO2 in the plant. So you have to gain it back again. Okay, so hopefully you study that. Hopefully you do, the whole lab, the virtual lab, is talking just about this, the relationship between the mitochondria and the chloroplast, the relationship between cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So do that virtual lab if you haven't done it already. It's due tomorrow, so. Okay, let's move on to the next step. Now here, what I, there's not really, I don't want you to know the details. I don't want, I do not want you to know the details. I'm only showing you this for one reason, one reason only. I want you to see you're taking three CO2s, which means how many carbons? Three carbons, because CO2 has one carbon each, and three of them means three carbons, right? Mm -hmm. You're putting them through these cycles, these bunch of chemical reactions. You're adding how many ATPs? Six. Six. And how many NADPHs? Six, right? So you, you take those three, you use all that ATP, and what do you make? How many carbons? Three carbons, see the one, two, three, one, two, three. This is the sugar, it's a three carbon sugar. Put two of those together, what do you get? A glucose, right? So this is a three carbon sugar. Guess what this kind of photosynthesis is called? No, this type of photosynthesis. 
not the process. You're right, this is the Calvin cycle. But, mm, you kind of. It's just, it, it, you're going to kick yourselves. But you again, it's in the reading. It's in the chapter. It's called C3 Photosynthesis. Okay, there is a C4. That's next. We'll talk about C4 in just a minute. But, okay, this is C... Okay. C3 and C4 are two different things, kid. So this is C3. It's a normal photosynthesis, what we call, what we teach you in elementary school. You should have learned this idea of photosynthesis in, in elementary school. That's C3. K through 8, rather, not elementary, but K through 8, right? No. Guys, why don't you listen to me? Just listen to me. Let's pretend like I know what I'm talking about. This is C3 photosynthesis. There is a C4 photosynthesis and a CAM photosynthesis. So there's two more kinds of photosynthesis. It's basically the same. Everything else is the same, except we got to talk. But before I can explain to you those two types of photosynthesis, we have to talk about why they need to exist. Am I clear? Yes. Okay, so pay attention. I'll explain it. Again, three molecules of carbon dioxide means three carbons. All this stuff happens. Do I want you to know all this stuff? No. Do you need to know it maybe later in college? Sure. For sure you need to learn it for college. But three come in. Three carbons, three sugar carbons are made. That's why it's called C3, 3C, right? Three carbon sugars. And two of those three carbon sugars make glucose or whatever else you want to make. You, use, you can use glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make a lipid or a sugar or whatever the plant wants to make within limits. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's all there is to that. Let me move on. Now let's talk about C4 photosynthesis. And why is C4 photosynthesis even necessary? So pay attention and as, I, as I walk you through this story. Rubisco evolved billions of years ago when CO2 was high and oxygen was low. It turns out when it's really hot, like in the tropical areas or in the desert, Rubisco doesn't work as well. Instead of grabbing CO2, it grabs oxygen. That's a problem, because can you make sugar from oxygen? No. Why not? No carbon. So that's a problem. We call that photorespiration. That's a real big problem for plants. If you're a plant on planet Earth, you did such a good job changing the atmosphere. and You made this Earth beautifully blue instead of gorgeously purple, but okay. You also changed the atmosphere. That was great for animals. You allowed all these other creatures to exist, right? But now that your problem is you can't you can't get, make any more sugar because there's too much oxygen and it's too daggone hot, especially if you're in the jungle or in a desert. So how do these plants that live in the jungle, because there's a lot of plants, right? You've seen rainforests. There's plenty of plants. And you see there's plants in deserts as well. How do these hot places, how can you have photosynthesis occurring? One way is C4 photosynthesis. C4 photosynthesis, what the first thing it does is it takes the carbon in what are, we separate, by the way, I'm going to write it down just so we're clear. We separate, the, the strategy is to separate photosynthesis by space. And what do I mean by that? I mean to say that First, you capture the CO2 over here in this thing called PEP in what's called the mesophyll cells, which is the layer of tissue outside, the outside. You see this would be outside the air, right? The stoma would be out here. In these mesophylls, you capture it, you turn it into what? <coughs> malate. Do you need to know malate? No. But I'm asking you, how many carbons is malate? Four. <gasps> see? All right, so it's four carbons. That's all. That's why it's called C4 photosynthesis. Malate gets transferred over into this tissue called the, B, the bundle sheath cells. They're on the inside, an inner layer of tissue. 
And in these, do you need to know bundle sheet cell or mesophyll? No. I just want you to know on the out, you separate photosynthesis by space. And here in this inner space, malate turns into what? Can we turn off the phone? Just turn it off. I don't care whose it is. Turn it off or mute it. Put out airplane mode. This is why teachers get mad at you, just for the record. So malate turns into CO2. Malate is, and now here you have a lot of CO2. What is it you don't have a lot of? Oxygen. Because where's the oxygen being made? Up here, because this is where the light reactions are happening. Here's the ATP. Here's the water being broken down. Here's the NADPH being made. All that's being made here. The oxygen's leaving through the stoma. No problems. No, there's very little oxygen down in here. And a lot of CO2. So no matter how hot it is, so Rubisco can't, Rubisco's right here. It's taking the CO2 and it's capturing, putting it in, this, in the Calvin cycle. Rubisco can't choose oxygen because it doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So, we, so the strategy of C4 photosynthesis, everything else about photosynthesis stays the same. The only thing about C4 is that you're separating it by space because of photorespiration. So key words, key words that really you should know by tomorrow. Photorespiration, separating by space, C4. And if you want to know malate, it might be a good idea. I won't test it, but you should know because it'll help you remember why it's called C4. So that's C4 photosynthesis in a nutshell. That's what you need to know for the test on it for C4 photosynthesis. You know C3 photosynthesis, you're okay with that. Now let's look at CAM photosynthesis, which is what desert plants use. I don't know what he said, I don't care. So here's a diagram. Again, this is right. These diagrams are in your book. You should have read them. Of course, some people haven't, but that's okay. The classic examples are pineapples for the tropical plants. Pineapples, they do C4 photosynthesis. Almost all, all I want to say a lot of the tropical plants, if not most of them, do this C4 photosynthesis. These, these things called corn also do something called cam photosynthesis, cacti do cam photosynthesis, right? Places where they're hot and dry. And we'll, talk, we'll see why in just a minute. Now let's take a look at this, what's interesting about cam photosynthesis. Remember, these are the examples here. I'm gonna, let you, I'm gonna freeze it on here for a second to let you kind of absorb it, right? See, cam photosynthesis here, what happens is we, instead of separating photosynthesis by space, what are, we, what are you separating them by? Time. That's right. By time. No, no one needs to fail. Everyone needs to get good grades. There's absolutely no reason why you should fail this. You've had plenty of time to do this work. If you haven't, you're going to have to push yourselves. But that's up to you. You either make this easy or hard. You're the one who does it. You're separating by time. So now we're looking at CO2 coming in. They see how it's all in the same tissue? It's all in the same, right? It's all in the same cell. This is all the Calvin side. So the first thing you do is you take CO2 and you make C4. So at night, at night, all you do is capture, capture the CO2. The, the cacti, who's ever been to the desert? Anybody here been to the desert? What is it at night? Cold. Cold. Very cold. Not cold. Cold. It gets cold. People. That's why you see people in the desert. They'll have ponchos. They'll have even wool sweaters, jackets, coats. Because at night, it can get very cold. The only reason it doesn't snow is because there's no water near. Because it's very dry. It's a cold, dry air. During the day, it gets what? Very hot. It's still dry, but it's super hot. That's right. You can cook on a rock. It's so hot, literally. Fry an egg right on a, on a rock, yeah? Okay, so we're separating from that by time. Are you talking about the cam plants? Yeah, cam plants. We're talking about cam photosynthesis. You'll notice it's still dealing, uh, it's just called, it's still a C4 pathway, still four carbons, but we call it cam. Well, let's just, go, let's just think of cam as separating by time. 
Well, well, let me just, if you let me finish, and then we can move on, because you can ask me any questions you want after school, but it's 3, 3.13. I really want to finish the summary of this, so I can summarize and we can move on, okay? I'm sorry, I'll interrupt you, but let's move on. C4 photosynthesis, what you're doing is you're producing a, a four-carbon molecule that stores the carbon. Just take, keeps take all night long, these plants, corn does it, uh, cacti do it, they open up their stoma and they take in all the CO2 they can. They let out all the oxygen they can. All right? they do, the oxygen becomes an equilibrium, right? dynamic equilibrium. But the CO2 keeps coming in, they keep taking it, they keep taking it, capturing it, fixing it, right? called fixing it. They capture, capture, capture. Then during the day they close off the stoma. No gas can come in or out. No more CO2 coming in. No more oxygen coming in. No more oxygen coming in. That's it. So what do they do at, during the day? They do the light reactions. And then that, all, that, all that CO2 that they, that they stored in, the four carbon sugar, in those four carbon molecules, they release them. So now what do you have in this space? You have high CO2, right? High CO2, relatively low oxygen. So even though it's super hot, in the, the, the rubisco can only choose what? CO2. CO2, or mostly chooses CO2. So here again is another solution to photorespiration. Here again, the rubisco is able to choose CO2, which means you can make the what? The sugar. Because if it picks oxygen, it can't make sugar. So we don't want it to pick oxygen. We want it, the plant doesn't want it to pick oxygen. It wants it to pick CO2. So here we separated it by time. So there's basically three steps to photosynthesis plus one, three plus one, right? And there's three kinds, but we know that the three kinds are C3 photosynthesis, which is just photosynthesis, and this one part happens in the in the thylakoid membrane called the light reactions. The other part happens in the sto in the Stroma, which is the space inside the chloroplast, that's it for photosynthesis, right? Then the C4, that's where we separate it by space, the mesophyll cells and the sheath bundle cells, but you don't have to know where, just know that they separate it by space using a four carbon molecule so that we can deal with the reasons that, for that whole photorespiration deal. Then CAM is separating by time. We do part, we capture the CO2 at night, or we open up the stoma. That solves that problem that we asked, how do we... How is it that cacti can stop losing water? They don't lose water because at night it's cold, so the water doesn't evaporate. So then when they close the stoma and it gets hot, the water's evaporating, it stays in the cell because it can't get out because the stomas are closed. All right. So now what are the steps that we're talking about here? Photosynthesis. For, this is common for all, th all three types of photosynthesis. The first step is photosystem two. It's the same step in all three kinds. Light, in, light, uh, light excites the electron. Enzyme breaks up water where you get the electron. That's where you get the electron. The second step is the electrons pass from carrier to carrier, like a game of hot potato, right? And as the electron is passed, from, uh, hydrogen ions are attracted across the membrane from high to low. Oops, it's from low to high. But trapping the hydrogen on one side of the membrane, it's actually say from low to high. That's my bad. If we could just wait a second, that should be low to high. And electron goes from uh, goes to uh, photosystem one. That's the second photo event. Then more carriers and the high energy electron gets transferred to NADPH and then goes to the Calvin cycle. Where do you get this stuff? Why do you do this? Look, hydrogen ions get here. They're trapped. ADP get, once you have it, the high concentration of hydrogen ions go through the ATP synthase. You go from AD, NA, ADP plus to ATP, and that's, that's where you get your ATP. So that's photosystems one, two. That's chemiosmosis, and that's the Calvin cycle. Good luck. Remember all three kinds of photosynthesis. You should do well on the test if you've done all your practice homework. Remember, you have the practice test questions, and I'm, I'm picking the questions from the practice test.